Kevin scores a zero twice on the same test. I teach at the college level. Years back, I taught a freshman slash sophomore class that met every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. One Wednesday, I gave a chapter exam. It was easy. I had a word bank of 25 terms and concepts at the top of the test, and the 20 questions of the exam were different definitions or descriptions of those terms. All the students had to do was match the corresponding term from the word bank to its definition or description, with five unused terms left over in the word bank. All the correct answers were right there. That Wednesday, almost half of my class was missing. There was a university function going on and no one thought to mention it to me. This was before emails were prevalent. But I gave the test anyway and Kevin was there and took the test. He answered all 20 and got them all wrong. A zero. That Friday, I told the whole class that those who took the test on Wednesday did not have to show up for class on Monday. Those who missed the test because of the school function were to show up and take the test on Monday. As I let class out, I called Kevin over to me and told him that as far as I was concerned, he wasn't even there Wednesday. He was to show up and take the test on Monday. He looked at me for a second and said, huh? Oh, thank you, Mr. Deacon. I didn't even bother making a new version of the test. It was just the leftover copies of the original test. Kevin took the test on Monday. Again, he answered all 20, and again, he got all 20 wrong, and he answered all but maybe two or three of them differently. When I handed them back out, I gave him both of his. At the end of the semester, Kevin tried to bribe me with $100 to give him an A in the class. Uh, well, Kevin, at least you tried to get an A <laughs> illegally, but you tried anyway. Uh, guys, I just don't know how you can do a test once, get a zero. That's bad enough. Uh, and then do it again and get a zero when the questions are exactly the same. How is that possible? Um, guys, hopefully you now know a bit more about what this subreddit is like and what a Kevin truly is. Because the person in this story, yes, that was a Kevin 100%, unlike his test score. Now for our next story. Kevin thinks that the Bahamas are a US state. Let me pretext this by saying that I always thought that nobody was dumb and everyone deserved a chance at higher education. Kevin is the first and only guy I met that has made me think that, well, maybe college just isn't for everyone. I'm in my final year of my undergrad, just going through the motions until I graduate. I'm in a purely online program at a major university, but I have classmates that also meet in person for school. At the start of a semester, it's pretty common in online classes to get emails from classmates asking to form a group. I usually don't join these myself because they quickly become a hub for cheating and I just don't want to take a chance of expulsion, but I decided to give it another go. I joined the group for my state and local government class. This is important for the story and everything is fine. People are getting along. That is until the first quiz our quizzes are 50 questions long a fact that some complain about but they are overall not that hard but then you have kevin the quizzes were multiple choice so we got our grades immediately and all of us are sharing our grades with each other then kevin chimes in i got a 10 out of 100 another group member says wait how i couldn't find the answers what do you mean i say I mean, I couldn't find them online anywhere. The answers are in the text. Why would you go online? Well, usually when I do quizzes, I search for the question and Quizlet has the answers. Quizlet, for those that don't know, is an online study tool that is frequently abused and is an ever-growing problem. To combat this, our professor specifically stated in an email to us that he changes the format and wording of the quizzes each semester in order to combat cheating. I explained this to Kevin. Well, that's stupid. Nobody responds, and the group is quiet until the first essay is due. I thought that maybe the issue with Kevin was a one-off, but nope. When we got back the grade for the essay, the group again was chatting away about grades and in rolls Kevin. In these essays, we're asked to compare the different aspects of two different state governments. Kevin says, I got a 30 out of 100. Oh, literally, how? It's not my fault. The professor said in his comments that one of my states wasn't a state. I already emailed him about it. At this point, I'm thinking that a political science professor would clearly know what is and isn't a state. So I asked Kevin what state he chose. Florida and the Bahamas. Are you joking? Another group member just says, uh, no, I'm not joking. The Bahamas are a foreign country not a US state. 
Yes, it is. I go there for vacation with my family all the time. Apparently, the only qualification for a state to Kevin is that he has visited it. No, they aren't. Yeah, they are. The professor already emailed me saying he made a mistake. All of us, clearly knowing that he's lying about that, just don't respond. And the group is quiet again. Kevin doesn't chime in for the next few quizzes or essays, so we thought he might have dropped the class. But nope. He chimes in randomly one day during the week and asks if he can borrow someone's essay to get pointers. I don't pay any attention to it, but one person who finished theirs chimes in to help him out. Later on, we're getting our quiz grades in and people are talking about them again. Then Kevin chimes in. I got a 20 out of 100. Bruh. I thought maybe that this time the answers would be online. Wait, have you been trying this every week? Yeah? And are the answers ever online? No, but they have to be on there at some point. I just exit out of the app at that point because of the sheer stupidity. Then essay grades roll around and this is magical. We're all comparing grades and giving tips on how to improve our writing. Then Kevin comes into the convo and he is fuming. I got a zero. What the F? And the professor said I was going to be cited for academic dishonesty. The group member from before says, uh, don't tell me you tried turning in my paper. Yeah, I did. You wrote that for me, right? No, I didn't. That was my paper. You, you only said you wanted it for help. You told me I could have it. I never said that. This went on for a while and ended when Kevin asked if they knew anybody on campus that could write essays for him. The creator of the group promptly shut down the group out of fear of being accused of supporting cheating. We were all later invited back to a new group, this time without Kevin. Yo, uh, I know there's a bad stereotype about Americans and geography in general, but surely the majority of Americans know that the Bahamas, you know, that country is not a US state. I mean... <laughs> Is it even close to America? I don't even think it is that close, right? It's like, is it in the, it's the, in the Caribbean, which is below America, you know? Uh, anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, I don't know if Kevin's just exist in school these days or in college. I mean, that seems to be the case with these first two stories. But nonetheless, Kevin, if you're going to get, you know, if you're going to cheat in the first place and get an essay off someone else, don't copy it word for word. Don't just hand it in straight away. You know, maybe take a few pointers here and there, but um, don't just try and hand in the exact same piece of work that that guy has handed in. You're obviously going to get caught up on that. I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, Kevin, why, man? Why? Now for our next story. A little bit different now. Kevin finds beer. Years ago, when I was but a wee teen, my friends and I walked a few blocks to a local taco truck to get some food. This particular truck was right off a local highway frequented by truckers shipping goods all around the country. On the walk home, we all see a water bottle filled with a mysterious brown liquid. Friend one and two walk past the bottle saying nothing about it. They just keep eating their tacos. Kevin, in front of me, and another friend suddenly yells, Hey, guys, look what I found! Kevin picked up the bottle with a mischievous look on his face. My immediate thought is he's going to do something awful like throw the bottle at one of us or a car. I barely get the words, Kevin, what are you doing out? Before he brings the bottle to his face and unscrews the cap. Oh my God, it's pee, he screams, horrified. He then spikes the bottle to the ground and liquid splashes everywhere. He begins to run. Moments later, the most noxious smell I've ever smelled hits my nose. This wasn't a simple porta potty in the summer smell, no. This was the urine of a trucker whose diet consists of Mountain Dew, junk food, and not nearly enough water. This urine had fermented in the July sun for untold days until it obtained a rich hickory color. This urine was now assaulting my nose with a hatred I thought was reserved for demons and other malevolent entities. I joined Kevin in fleeing from the noxious smell. We get about 50 feet away from the disaster and stop to regain our composure. Out of nowhere, I vomit. The sight of this causes a friend to vomit. This causes another friend to vomit, which then causes me to vomit again. Then about halfway between the bottle and ourselves is our fat friend who never ran, standing there idly eating his tacos. I ask how he could possibly continue to eat after all that. He just kind of shrugs and takes another bite. We all laugh and then someone finally asks Kevin, why in the world did you open that bottle? He replies sheepishly, I thought it was beer. 
Why would anyone put beer in a water bottle and leave it on the road? Also, beer is not that color. I mean, to be fair to Kevin, the color of pee is not too dissimilar to the color of beer, is it? They're both kind of yellowy, so it's not the weirdest uh, remark I've ever heard. But no one would ever in their right mind leave a beer just randomly on the sidewalk, I don't think, or just in some sort of garage wherever they were, especially if it was full. That just wouldn't really tend to happen. Um, so I guess picking it up is, is weird enough. I don't know why you would do that unless literally the lid was on and it was, you know, fixed on. You'd have to use a bottle opener to open it and you could see that. Then don't touch that beer, dude, because it might just not be one. Now moving on to our final story about Kevin. Kavina, I imagine that might be a female Kevin, fries up household objects for midnight snacks. Throughout the years, my mother has repeatedly turned on the wrong burner on every electric stove we've ever owned. Now, usually this results in her wondering why food isn't cooking and then realizing a moment later. However, I've lived on my own in the same small apartments for eight years and she's gone into the unfortunate habits of putting things on the stove when she runs out of counter space. One of my cutting boards has two separate imprints of a burner on it. Partly thanks to her, I now have a rule that nothing goes on the stove unless it's for cooking. She doesn't seem to have learned the lesson though. Last night at 2.30 a.m., I woke up to the burning smell of plastic and a smoke alarm. After I opened the window and turned it off, I went to investigate. It turns out my mum had been making a midnight snack and had accidentally turned two separate burners on and had the bright idea of putting her laptop on the stove so she could continue watching Netflix on it. She says she started noticing the burning smell and didn't realize what was happening until her laptop shut down. The terrifying thing was that it didn't power down. She brought me her computer with most of the back completely melted and the fan was going insane. I couldn't even pull the battery immediately because the plastic around the switches was melted. So I just held the power button. It's a cheap elite book from around 2014 and normally you can just slide the back off. But part of it is so melted that I had to rip the other pieces off around it. Surprisingly, the internals actually seem to be fine, certainly the hard drive at least, so I can get her files back if nothing else. She's probably gonna try using it later, and I'm mildly afraid. Not gonna lie, when I first read the title of this, I genuinely thought that this Kevin or Kavina, maybe that's the word for female Kevin, was frying up plastic and stuff to eat during the night, not just doing it accidentally. I kind of misinterpreted that one. Let me know if you also did as well. Uh, but nonetheless, why would you ever put your laptop on the stove? Surely you just put it, you know, next to you on the counter or something. On the stove is so risky, especially <laughs> as you have a history of burning up things that aren't meant to be burned just weird i also love the laptop is still working i just know right that this woman is going to do the exact same thing in the future and gradually she's just going to melt away more and more of our laptop until there's barely anything left but um that's the fun of cooking with this person i guess weird one <laughs> high school kevin Okay, so I'm 22 now and I probably will not forget this guy for as long as I have a decent memory of high school. My school was, well, it wasn't the best. In fact, we are one of the lowest scoring schools in the area, which probably explains why it was full of Kevins and Kavinas. But this guy was just something else. I had a lot of classes with Kevin at the start of high school, and for some reason, all the girls had a crush on him. He apparently lost his V-card at the age of 10. I refuse to believe this because he was disgusting. One class we'd had was personal slash social education. This is for things like drug talks, sex ed, etc. One day we're talking about our dream jobs. Now we're like 13 to 14 at this time. And unfortunately for me, our teacher put Kevin right at the front next to me so she could keep an eye on him. We go around the room and talk about the careers we want. It gets to me and I said something along the lines of maybe becoming an animator because I'm good at cartoons, just not realistic drawing. Then we get to Kevin. Now the teacher just gives a heavy sigh when she says it's his turn because we all know it's going to be gross or stupid. I want to be a prawn star, he proudly announces with the stupidest smile. I have the balls for it. So the teacher tells him it has to be serious. Fine, sperm donor. And that was the end of that. Same class, same seats. This time we had to get to know our classmates, even though we spent two to three years with each other already. We had to write a small talk about ourselves and our family members. So I mentioned that I'm chronically ill and explain why it sucks. But when I get back to my seat, Kevin moves his chair away. What are you doing? I'm obviously confused here. I don't want to catch what you have. 
I'm dumbfounded. I didn't think anyone could be so stupid. No, it's not contagious. I was born with it. Don't ask why I tried to explain this because it didn't work. He whined until the teacher finally moved him. He also stole a teacher's brand new iPhone from her desk. He got caught because he was the last person to leave registration that morning. And he also asked the teacher if he could see the phone. He did this because he wanted to get his girlfriend at the time a better Christmas present because he wanted everyone to think he was rich. In drama class, he pulled out a used condom from his bag and paraded it around on his head. He wouldn't tell us where he got it from. The teacher caught him trying to tie it to someone's backpack and he still refused to tell anyone where it came from. The last I heard, he's a father to a girl from a different school. I don't think they're together anymore, but he also apparently bought a car, even though he hasn't passed his driving tests or even started lessons. This car was expensive. He thinks he basically bought a sports car. It's not. He bought a rundown car that I think is something small like a Toyota Yaris. It's covered in rust and the whole thing is probably going to fall apart the minute anyone tries to start the engine. From what I've heard, he's still as stupid, so it's a miracle that he had a child. He still says he's going to be a prom star, even though he thinks OnlyFans is gross? I really hope I never run into this guy again, because I might just end up slamming my head into a desk. Yeah, guys, I think this is just a typical Kevin right here. I mean, the number of dumb things this guy has done in his life is honestly kind of unbelievable. I mean, well, first of all, you'd buy a car without even passing your license or even having any lessons. What if you're terrible at driving and you don't even have the skills to pass, even with lessons? You just bought a car for no reason, just to what, sit on the street? Okay, that's one thing. Second of all, coming into class with a used condom. That is, um, yeah, pretty mad. I'm not sure why you'd ever do that. And then third of all, asking a teacher to see their brand new iPhone and then just stealing it to give to your girlfriend for Christmas. <laughs> like, how do you think you're going to get away with that? You, you've asked your teacher to see the iPhone. The iPhone goes missing. They're only going to look in one direction, Kevin. And unfortunately, mate, it's going to be yours. Now moving on to our next story, absolute gold from Twitter. Below is a transcribed tweet thread from a Twitter user. Now it starts off slowly, but this is the best genuine Kevin sighting I've seen in the wild for years. Enjoy. So pretty much guys, this is a long list of everything that this Kevin has ever done. When I was a movie theater projectionist, the other projectionist, Matt, would bring clam chowder for lunch every single day, refusing to put it in the fridge, even though the projection hallway was well over 100 degrees. Matt once got into an argument with another employee, so fierce that the off-duty cop who was doing security had to break them up, all because Matt had established that 50 cents get rich or die trying movie was based on hamlet it wasn't by the way matt's favorite thing to do after seeing fight club was cut a single frame of a titty into kids movies at a random spot and not tell anyone so the rest of us projectionists would have to wait until he left for the day then run the entire film to find and cut the frame back out oh my god concessions would put all the excess popcorn into massive bags at night and give them out to employees Matt would take as much as he could, hiding them in the loading dock. One day, he full speed crashed his truck into the loading dock, trying to pick up the secreted away popcorn. Matt was splicing Cars, the film, reels together one night and spliced it wrong, leaving it off center by millimeters. Then he let it run to spool up for the next show and went home. When we came back in the morning, it was so badly damaged, Disney sent insurance investigators to us. When asked by investigators about the car's mishap, Matt said that he clocked out but didn't go home, instead watching anime in the manager's office until 3am since it's the only place with a DVD player and TV, and he admitted to making a copy of the manager key on his lunch break. Our movie theater had to sign an insurance rider to be allowed to play Evil Dead because our track record was so bad and Matt wasn't even allowed to be near the machine. We had to rope it off and keep track of him. Management actually moved Matt to being an usher where he used a backpack vacuum on the movie screen, ripping a hole in it. The theater did not have backpack vacuums, by the way. He actually brought his own. Matt told me a long story about how he had joined the Navy and it didn't work out. So he joined the army and in basic training, a drill sergeant said, and I quote, Matthew, you're too smart for the army. I'm kicking you out. Like that would ever happen. 
Matt asked if I wanted to hang out one day, and not wanting to die by his hand, I said sure. We ended up at his apartment, which was actually his parents' basement, where he asked me to rap like Bill Clinton on the album he was recording. Matt handed me some of his lyrics, and they were about the Yakuza, the Japanese gangsters. He was not Japanese and had never been there, and then asked if I wanted to watch the anime Fruits Baskets? What? To get in the zone before rapping? About the Yakuza? The next day, he told me how awesome it was to have me on his album. I didn't even record anything, and that Kimoko loved having me there. Turns out, Kimiko Kimoko was his girlfriend, a very clearly Hispanic woman who spoke only Spanish. Matt did not speak Spanish. One time, Matt got into an argument with the manager of the comic book slash game store in the mall the movie theatre was attached to. He then proceeded to challenge the manager to a duel, and the manager, being a former marine, accepted immediately and produced the handgun he carried. Matt spent the next two days in the projection hallway. A. Worried he was going to die because he didn't own a gun. B. Lamenting that his karate wasn't good enough, he didn't even know karate. And C. Cry because there was nowhere else to buy magic cards. There was, by the way. In preparation for his duel with the Game Store Marine, Matt asked me where to get a gun. Me being a high school nerd who was too afraid to speak to a girl, thinking somehow I knew where to get a burner pistol. Instead of shooting him dead, the Marine just banned Matt from the store. So Matt then picketed with a sign alone outside the store in the atrium of the mall every day until more management told him he was banned from the mall. Matt then had to use the loading dock to get into work. The theatre used to show movie series as an event, like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, and management had to put a sign up in the break room and hallways that said, Matt isn't allowed to speak about Star Wars, and the sign would change based on the movie series being shown. Since he had destroyed his truck on the loading dock, Matt spent his life savings on souping up a Pontiac G6 to look like the Batmobile. He decided to actually do the work himself, and because he was not a mechanic, the body kit came off on the highway and he crashed, totaling the car. When 50 Cent's Get Rich or Die Trying came out, the movie theatre got a palette of promotional materials. Now, Matt stole as much of it as he could and tried selling it on eBay, but came to find out no one actually gave a dang about Get Rich or Die Trying, so he brought it all back. Ushers were allowed to keep some stuff found under the seats as long as no one came to claim it within 30 days. Now, eventually, we realised Matt was stealing from the target next door and putting things below seats to find them because to him, it's not a legal stuff then anymore. Matt would spend his lunch breaks in the game room playing Dance Dance Revolution and got in trouble one day after he easily beat the 10 year old at Dance Dance Revolution, then loudly called him a female dog. The kid didn't even do anything. Matt just roasted him for nothing. <laughs> the theatre ran an event in 2006 to raise money for the children's hospital playing Smash Brothers on the big screen. Matt went out and bought an expensive custom pro gamer level GameCube controller, paid his $10 entry fee donation, and was beaten in the first round in seconds. <laughs> Some at the theatre weren't allowed to dress up in costumes for Halloween, as it was too dangerous. A 120 degree projection hall where no one could see your costume, for example. One Halloween, Matt showed up in a movie quality Stormtrooper costume and passed out immediately in the heat. Matt got suspended from the projectionist job after destroying the copy of Cars, so they put him in the ticket booth, where he held the record for the fastest firing when he convinced an old woman to see Hostel instead of Last Holiday. Now guys, whereas Last Holiday is a rom-com, Hostel is actually a, uh, a horror film, so you can see why he might be fired for this. Matt would sell single frames cut from the previous reels on eBay, claiming that they were original frames from the first run of the movie and forging the certification documents. According to him, he made $30,000 a year doing this and it was not illegal at all. It was. When he was working concessions, Matt would berate and insult people's food choices, which none of the management stopped because people would buy more in the hopes Matt would just shut the heck up for a few minutes. An older woman fell down in one of the auditoriums and couldn't get up. So instead of calling 911 or using the radio every usher was given, Matt ran full speed across the building screaming, medical, medical, only for the woman to be fine and it was Matt who just wouldn't let her get up. 
On days when Matt wouldn't bring lukewarm chowder for lunch, he would order from the Papagino's pizza that was in the mall. And because he was banned from the mall for threatening and picketing the game store, he had to pay to have it walked across the mall and delivered to him. <laughs> the theater would host kids parties. One day, there were too many parties scheduled and not enough party staff. So my manager asked me and Matt to do a kids Halo themed birthday. And the family asked for a refund because Matt kept arguing with the kid about Halo and Master Chief. <laughs> Matt showed up to work once wearing a chainmail top under his work polo and when asked why, he said that he didn't want to be late for work. I asked why he didn't just take it off now that he was here and he stomped away, then spent the whole shift making jingly noises as he moved. This thread gets weirder and weirder the more I read. The first time I saw Matt cry was when the bulb burst on the projector playing Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And in despair, he openly wailed as he tried to explain to me that people need to see it, ignoring that we still needed to fix the bulb, which was still on fire, in the machine. When Matt worked in concessions, he figured out a way to cook frozen chicken tenders faster, which was to keep them in the bag and to poke a hole to vent the air. The bag promptly caught fire, a fire he didn't notice until the timer went off and he opened an oven full of flames. When the Target store attached to the mall caught him stealing, he was banned from the store. And instead of picketing outside, like he had done with the game store, he devised a plan to trick them into letting him back in, which amounted to buying a red shirt and walking in. <laughs> Matt, what a trick. No one is falling for that, my friend. Matt's two brothers worked with us. One, a PhD in anthropology, who was waiting for a teaching job, and another who was a long-haired musician just wanting to be left alone. They stopped driving to work together when Matt nearly drove them off the the road arguing about Metallica. Matt was really into the band Rush, which I had never heard of, and I made the mistake of asking him about them. After an entire shift, I had heard more facts about Rush than I'd wanted or needed, and Matt had become so incensed he was playing air guitar instead of working. One day, Matt's girlfriend, Kimiko, came by to drop off his chowder, and even though it wasn't allowed, he let her come up into projection. Now, Kimiko actually stayed the entire shift and spent the whole 12 hours standing silently at the viewing window watching Over the Hedge over and over. Now, Over the Hedge, a great film, but I wouldn't want to watch it over and over, that's for sure. When Kingdom of Heaven came out, a medieval war movie starring Orlando Bloom, Matt showed up with friends in chainmail and a shield slash sword and missed getting arrested for carrying a sword in public only because he convinced the cops it was a promotion for the theater it wasn't. In winter, Matt had got on another car, an old front wheel drive Buick or something. And since it skidded a lot, one of our older ushers mentioned putting bricks in the trunk for weight. Matt didn't have any bricks, so he filled the trunk with sand. Not in bags, just like sand. The theater was built fast and was not well made, so there was always some repair that needed to be done. No one asked him to, but Matt would do these repairs. One morning, we came into work and he had drilled a hole in the projection office door to see out of just in case. When we ran trilogies and events, people would get dressed up and stand in line, and Matt would walk through the crowd during his shift to critique their costumes and provide unsolicited advice. And when he was told he'd be fired if he kept doing it, he would come in on his days off and do it. Matt had a big heart. He really did. We had a big opening. I don't remember which, but there's a huge line and chaos. And though they didn't schedule Matt for work that day, he showed up knowing we needed help. Unfortunately, however, Matt showed up the day after the premiere. Matt loves swords and knives so much. Man, like he would spend his free time talking to me about swords and sword accessories and would quiz me on like what the deadliest sword was and berate me for being an idiot when I didn't know it was a scimitar. I don't know how to pronounce that guys, but I've never heard of it. Just like OP apparently. Matt would spend a shift telling me random facts about things, but I didn't have a smartphone in 2006, so I just had to listen to him tell me wild stuff like, blue whales speak German, or did you know if you fire a gun into a bank, it's technically not illegal? Uh, by the way, they don't speak German and it is illegal. Matt refused to call himself a medieval LARPer. He instead kept referring to it as my hobby or training, but would never explain what he was training for. He would just say, you never know when you're gonna need it. It was swordmanship skills. Ah, LARPer, okay. 
Matt would also reference his skills as a hacker whenever computers came up and how it was so cool, like a scene from The Matrix, and that he would say, it's just like in The Matrix. But what he really meant was that he would guess friends' passwords and then post on their MySpace. Matt was convinced that if you record a movie from the projection window, as long as you do it in small parts and not one long recording, it's fine. It's not. When the management found out about this, every employee was required to sign a sheet acknowledging that it's not okay. <laughs> yeah, that's just piracy. What? Matt used to harass the FedEx guys about getting a real job, even though he and I made minimum wage at $5.15 until one day the FedEx manager sent him a letter accusing him of harassment and the theater had to ban him from accepting film drop-offs. When Hostel came out, it was a big deal. The media and parents went out of their way to demonize it and we had to keep track of people's ages entering the auditorium it was shown in. Matt couldn't be trusted with this because he would let kids into the movie to toughen up. In a moment of rage, Matt broke the projection office chair and getting another one would have been impossible. So he spent two hours repairing it with the small tool set we had for the projectors. And when he sat down on it, it collapsed further, sending him into the wall of reels. When King Kong was delivered, it was so much film, it required a second platter to sit on. So you had to spool it from one to the other using a tool stick with a roller on the top. Matt stood there and watched the film silently on the stick instead of on the screen it was on. <laughs> Matt, why? <laughs> why, Matt? Matt used to crush Red Bull as off. Sorry, he used to crush Red Bull as often as he could, but then he would get the shake. Oh, crush as in drink, right. But then he would get the shakes real bad. And one time, while handing a woman her family's entire order of chicken and personal pizzas, he instead just sort of flung it at her, hitting her square in the chest harder than ever. Honestly, I, I am so bemused by this character that I genuinely thought there was a world in which Matt actually might physically crush Red Bulls. It just seems like the sort of thing he could be doing here. And finally, we had just one real manager and two teenage assistant managers. So it was easier to cover up screw ups rather than to try and fix them. I remember I cut a movie out of order. So Matt was like, I'll fix it. And instead of fixing it, he just ran different previews for 20 minutes. And there you go. That is the story of Matt. I mean, normally what I do at the end of stories is I go through the, you know, the main points of the story and, you know, talk about them and, and say what I think. In this story, I'm not even going to even attempt to do that. I mean, let's just talk about Matt himself. I don't know if he's, you know, a Kevin. I mean, yes, he is a Kevin. He's clearly very stupid, but he seems like a really nice guy. He's just doing all of this stuff out of maybe just not understanding, just a lack of common sense, just being pretty dumb. But the fact that, you know, he's coming in on his days off to help out. Yeah, he's not coming in on the right day, but at least he's doing that sort of stuff. It shows he's got a good heart. I was thinking throughout the whole thing, why not just fire this guy? Just let him go. Say, come on, Matt, you're out of your depth there. You're kind of ruining this whole theater. But I kind of get why he'd probably be quite nice to be around, you know, maybe sometimes when he's not, you know, talking to you about random facts that aren't true or about, you know, heavy metal bands. I don't know. It's a hard one, right? Without meeting this guy in real life, you can't tell if he's really annoying or just a really nice guy that's very dumb. I wouldn't really know. But guys, if you, you know, were Matt's boss, would you keep him around for the fun of it? Or would you think, nah, you know what? This is just way too difficult. He's got to go. Let me know down below in the comments. I'm on the fence. I'm not completely sure. I think I keep, you know what? I think I keep him. I think I just would. Kevin sells a car for $20. So back in the early 90s, my uncle was walking home at around 2 a.m. He forgot the reasoning why, but he remembered that he ran into a Kevin. This Kevin looked a bit deranged and was clearly an addict of some sorts. Kevin engaged with Uncle Dave and begged for $20. Uncle Dave knew that he was an addict and he didn't want to give him the money. Kevin then said that he would sell his car for $20 out of desperation. This caught Uncle Dave's attention, but it was a terrible car according to him. And in a final act of desperation, Kevin told Uncle Dave that the car had a 1979 Monte Carlo. Now, if you're like me and don't know anything about engine values, according to Uncle Dave, that engine would be roughly worth $15,000 today. So Uncle Dave immediately took the car home. When he got home, Grandpa ran outside barefoot in the Michigan snow, yelling why the heck he brought home such a terrible car. Uncle Dave argued that the engine was a Monte Carlo, but Grandpa only saw an old motor. It took a while, but Uncle Dave convinced Grandpa to keep the engine and he hoisted it out of the car. 
Now with the engine out, he had no use for the chassis and grandpa didn't want it there either. So the next morning he called his buddy to tow the car back to where he got the car, tossed the keys on the driver's seat and abandoned the car. He sold the Monte Carlo for $10,000 not long after and used that money to buy himself a new truck. Now OP has actually included a bonus story as well. So in the early 2000s, my uncle Dave and some of his friends decided to go fishing up north in the upper peninsula of Michigan. Now, if you don't live here in Michigan, the weather is messed up, meaning that we can have 70 degree weather in February and have rain, snow and hail on the same day in June. So they were idiots in that moment and they went when it was nice out, didn't check the weather forecast and assumed that it would be warm for the rest of the trip. Well, it was a blizzard the day after they set up camp and they huddled into their sleeping bags to preserve heat. However, Uncle Dave is a stubborn man and refuses to admit defeat. So what he did was he literally cut up his sleeping bag into a makeshift coat. Now this sleeping bag was an old one that was filled with feathers. So there were just feathers everywhere. He managed to catch a lot of fish and he earned the nickname, the chicken man. Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure how I feel about this one, guys, to be honest. It sounds to me like your Uncle Dave OP was just taking advantage of this guy who probably is an addict, as you said yourself, and is not really in the best sort of place to be, you know, thinking about cars or money at all. He just wants his fix of whatever drug he's addicted to. It's really sad, actually, that he'd be willing to sell such an expensive thing for just, you know, a, a little bit of money to, to fund his drug addiction. But then maybe I guess he just didn't actually know the price of the car. But no, surely anyone would know that a car is worth more than $20. Yeah, overall, that's just the sad one. Now, guys, OP has actually left a little edit down below his post uh, in regards to some comments like mine that I've just said that are saying to him, you know, this post is actually really sad. So let's see what he had to say. So I didn't think this originally, but the car could be a stolen car. I do believe that it could have been stolen, but simply put, Uncle Dave was young and stupid and was blinded by money. I personally believe that it wasn't stolen. Yeah, that does make more sense to me. If it was a stolen car, then I guess that makes more sense that this guy, this homeless guy would be more willing to just, you know, get rid of it for a little buck uh, and then find his drug addiction that way rather than, you know, having to sell it without papers and all that, yada, yada. It's probably really hard. So that does make more sense to me. However, then OP, you said you personally believe that it wasn't stolen. I think that just shows that Uncle Dave is, is not the greatest guy, right? He's literally just taking advantage of this guy who, you know, is addicted to drugs and is like, yeah, fine, I'll take your car. And the knowledge that he can make $10,000 out of it. I don't know. I reckon Uncle Dave is not the greatest guy. Just my opinion, guys. Let me know if you agree down below. Now, moving on to our next story. Kevin is going to get rich. I am a financial advisor for a living and a lot of my business comes from referrals. I did business with a woman in her mid 40s who then sent me her 27 year old son's contact information as a referral. I should have known I wouldn't be prepared for this when she scoffed and said that Kevin needed some serious help with his finances. I agreed that I'd reach out to him. I figured maybe at the very least he'd do business with me later or he would give me referrals too. Kevin and I agreed to meet the next week. He said he wasn't able to meet that week because he would be really busy recording songs at the studio. Oh boy, it only got worse from there. When Kevin came into the office, I saw through our glass doors that he looked like he was trying really hard to get the door open. His feet were anchored at the base and he was leaning far back with both hands on the handle. But there was a sign right in front of him to hit the intercom button to ask for entrance. I took Kevin to the building's cafe to get us both some coffee before we started our meeting. He got excited when he saw my Chase Freedom Unlimited card. He asked how I could hook him up with one because he thought that unlimited meant, well, having unlimited funds. I told him that there is no such thing as getting a credit card with unlimited funds and getting approved for a credit card depended on his credit score. Kevin said though that he could charm his way through the interview to get approved because he's a rising star of a rapper. He was stoked about getting a yacht, designer clothes, a Tesla, etc. soon. I began our meeting by asking about what he does for a living. Kevin tried to say he was an entrepreneur, but I was finally able to get the solid answer of him working as a pizza delivery driver. I asked him what an entrepreneur actually meant to him. Kevin said he is one because he isn't watched while he is driving on the job. Yeah, I'm not sure about that definition Kevin made. Kevin also claimed to make almost $20 an hour without tips, 
We also live in a state with low COL, so this was impossible. After asking him a few more questions, the exasperated Kevin wrote on my whiteboard that he was working two jobs, both as a pizza delivery driver. One paid $8 an hour, the other paid $9 an hour. He added the two together to get $17 an hour, emphatically circling his maths. I asked him if his work offered a 401k. Kevin's eyes lit up as he said, heck yeah, I'm finna be hella rich. I asked him how much he was contributing. Kevin replied, no, I signed up for five 401ks. That's what you gotta do to get rich. It turned out that Kevin thought that a 401k was $401,000 that you get in retirement simply by signing up for it. He told me to multiply that figure by five. Whatever the total amount was, was his current net worth. I asked Kevin what he felt would happen to social security benefits in the future. He said, I don't know. It's annoying to wait in line for a new card, but I guess my number stays the same each time. I advise that Kevin should just start by having a checking slash savings account and getting into the habit of regularly putting in money he doesn't spend. He told me he already had a checking account. He doesn't trust it though, because he thought the bank kept stealing his money. I asked what he meant by that. Kevin pulled up his bank account info on his phone. I saw his checking account's balance was minus $346. Kevin insisted that he had $346 to spend today and $296 from yesterday, but his card kept getting declined. Basically, he didn't understand that he was getting charged a $50 overdraft fee by the day. Kevin also pulled out a Visa gift card. He said this credit card was junk because it wouldn't go through either. I asked if he had called the activation number on the sticker. He said he thought that was just a pin number for the card. <laughs> Kevin, oh my God. Kevin couldn't understand that his car was in repo status because he couldn't keep up with his $300 per month payments. He said he paid 300 bucks to get his 2019 brand new Chevy Cruze out of the lot. He has it to drive, therefore he owns it, right? Um, no. To end the meeting, I agreed to listen to a snippet of Kevin's rap songs. It definitely was not made in a studio. It actually sounded like he'd pulled up some instrumentals of current rap songs, blasted it through his car stereo, and recorded it all through his phone. He said to watch out for his SoundCloud accounts. It's blowing up. He had a total of four followers and 15 to 20 listens per song. Throughout this whole meeting, I could not correct Kevin. Kevin would fight me on every single thing I tried educating him about. I didn't actually tell Kevin's mother how the meeting went. She did call me recently, telling me that he's a lost cause. She hopes he gets it together one day. You know what, guys? I reckon this Kevin is the future of the hip hop industry. You know, you'll be seeing this guy's name, whatever his real name is, on billboards everywhere, on top 40s. He'll, be, he'll get number one singles and you'll be like, wow, he originally came from this post. How has he made it? Well, that is the beauty of the music industry. Anyone can make it. Um, yeah, obviously, I'm talking waffle. This guy is clearly terrible at singing and rapping. But um, hey, he's got a dream. Why not let him go for it? You never know what could happen if he gets insanely lucky and somehow becomes good at rapping and I don't know, a lot of things would have to go his way. You never know. But um, I think his mum, his mum is truthful here, right? He's a lost cause, but um, he's doing what he likes. So just let him do it, I guess. Who knows? Now moving on to our final story, Kevin can't email good. So apparently I have a Kevin in one of my classes and I didn't know about it until today. This guy never turned anything in on time and never asked me anything outside of a few posts on the class discussion board in the first week. Today, I get notified that he's been complaining to my supervisor about how I'm not helping him. It turns out he sent me several emails throughout the semester and I haven't been answering them. There's just a couple of problems. One, he got my email wrong all semester long. I've been sending emails on a weekly basis to my classes, so he should know what it is. He not only got the format wrong, he spelled my name wrong. Even the student who keeps posting my first name as Andrew on her assignments gets my email right. Two, he sent them from his personal email. I did apparently get one email from him, but it got sent to spam because it wasn't from a school email. His email didn't have his name or which class he was in noted on it, and his personal email had no relationship to his actual name. 
it got automatically spammed since it looked really suspicious, especially since the link he included was messed up and looked fishy or virusy. This was why he got my email wrong as well, because he thought he sent that one to the wrong address. When this was brought up, all he did was complain about how it doesn't matter and that I'm making him fail by not answering his emails and that he rarely, if ever, received any of the class-wide emails from me. It turns out he wasn't checking a school account more than every other week and thought that using his personal account for everything was the norm. He never thought to reply to any of the class-wide emails either when he did get them since he thought I'd just ignore those two. Oh, he is a junior for what it's worth. Okay, so I was under the assumption that a junior in America, I assume this is in America, was someone young, but apparently, I've just looked it up, a junior is like 16 to 17 years old. So he's 16 to 17 and doesn't understand how emails work. This guy's done. He's done out. What's he going to do? Seriously, unless he just knows in the back of his mind that realistically he's been sending emails from the wrong account, probably to the wrong account as well. And he's just doing it, you know, he's doing it all the way along as an excuse to try and not do the work. Maybe this Kevin has a bigger brain than all of us combined. Um, but that seems unlikely. I reckon he is just very, very dumb, as the majority of people who the stories are about on this subreddit seem to be. I don't know, guys. I mean, when I was in school and even in university, you would only ever email your professors or your lecturers or your teachers with your school or uni email. Like, you don't even have to be clever to know that. <laughs> school email is for school. Personal email is for personal. Like, how dumb is this guy, man? You know what? I'm done with this video. Let's just let's just call it there. My nephew is the biggest Kevin I have ever met. This is the story of my nephew's disastrous adventures, how my family demanded I cure him of stupidity and how he was fired from each of his jobs. My family is kind of strangely staggered by age. My older brother is 37 and I'm 19. He's my only sibling, so I am, by extension, my nephew's only uncle. My nephew is also 19. My parents expect me to understand Kevin and to figure out what's wrong with him. Infuriatingly, they expect me to be an uncle slash mentor figure to Kevin and relate to him as a teenager. For context, let's go back to his younger years. The first true act of Kevinness that my idiot nephew pulled was his cyber attack on my dad's business site online. Kevin was only 14 when he did this. By cyber attack, I mean he went onto my dad's websites, my dad sells sports memorabilia, and posted prawn into the comment section of the sites. No, not just a little prawn, 7,000 image comments worth using a bot he found online. When asked why, he told my dad, all grandpas are horny, my friends at school said they are. Next was Kevin's genius 16th birthday stunt. At his party, he had a pool. He also had a garden gnome. He decided the best move for maximum coolness with his peers was the somersault off of a makeshift diving board made out of glued together two by fours. Not only jump off the diving board, but do an acrobatic with a gnome at the same time. Kevin leapt off the diving board. Keep in mind, there were seven other people in the pool and three more out of it, but nearby. As Kevin kicked off the board in reverse, plunging head and back first, he slammed his feet into the gnome and kicked it straight up. As Kevin crashed into the water, the spinning gnome experienced gravity. It slammed into Kevin's leg, which pulverized and put him on crutches for three months. He was lucky he didn't kill one of his friends with a gnome to the head. On his first day of real work this January, Kevin got an eight on the ACT and skipped college, Kevin was working at a gas station. He decided, since it was cold that day, that when he showed up, his best work attire would be a heavy coat and balaclava. That's right, he wore bank robber clothes because it was cold. They almost called the police until the inevitable, it's me, Kevin, when he pulled the mask off. Kevin is a big video gamer and actually has had some success on Twitch playing Minecraft. He has 500 subs. Why anyone would want to watch him do anything is beyond me. He probably digs straight down and mines at night. Anyway, here's a few of his misadventures in gaming. Wait, sorry. He has 500 subs on Twitch. That's mad. Also, guys, if you didn't know, I actually stream on Twitch occasionally as well. It's on screen right now if you want to come and follow me. R slash RotoYT. I stream a whole host of different games. Uh, yeah, come and watch me. So, back to his misadventures in gaming. He was caught trying to play real-life Minecraft, as he put it, for YouTube. That means going in the backyard with a pickaxe and digging holes in the lawn. That's a viral video right there. 
He bought a jar of borscht, Russian beet soup, at a grocery store and drank it on stream while playing Counter-Strike. I don't play it, but he says it has lots of Russians and he wanted to show super Slav energy. This guy's a legend. Next was his attempt at taking the SAT instead of the ACT. Kevin refused to study for his ACT retake and scored eight, an improvement from six on his first try. My school offered SAT for students who failed at ACT. Kevin got a 660, which he called hard work. He once went to a bank with a stack of CDs because he wanted a CD, a certificate of deposit. Jesus. He also jumped on my brother's, his father's knees while he was sleeping and ran out of the room. My brother woke up groaning in pain and Kevin just admitted it out of the blue. Another time, Kevin tried to ski in the house. That's right, skiing indoors. He put snow from outside on the stairs, came barreling down and slammed face first into the Christmas tree, which collapsed like his hopes of making the nice list that Christmas. The last story I can think of to post was the time he decided to do a boogeyman impersonation last weekend. I don't care that I'm a grown man, I freaked out on him over this one. Kevin jumped out of my closet at 2 a.m. during Thanksgiving this year. That's not the big deal. The big deal is I thought I was alone in my room for three hours in pitch black before Kevin wearing red light bulbs clipped to his glasses, leaped out of my closet, shrieking like a banshee and yelling in a shrill voice, I'm gonna eat you. A couple weeks ago, I bought a gun. Now that's unrelated to Kevin. And if I had been on the other side of the bed where I keep my gun, Kevin genuinely might have been a dead man. He scared me so good. Fast forward to the last three months. My family wants me to de-Kevinize him. I don't know where to start. This guy nearly tricked me into shooting him, and yet they want me to, one, act as a mentor as his uncle, and two, relate to him because I'm his age. This is insane. I hope you got a kick out of hearing about my idiot nephew. Well guys, I hope you can now see why the title of this video is the dumbest person of all time. Kevin... (laughs) I've got to say, mate, if you're not the dumbest person, you're definitely up there. Some of the stuff in this story, I'm, I can't even believe it, to be honest. Just what a crazy guy. He's the sort of person, in my opinion, though, that would probably be quite fun to be around. It's just when you have to, like, take responsibility for him. For example, in this story, OP is his, you know, uncle, so has to mentor him and try and be friends with him. That is tough. But if he was just your mate, you know, who you could see for a few hours, then leave when they started to get really annoying, he'd probably be a great laugh. Some of the stuff he's doing is insane. You know, skiing inside, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yes, if I owned the house, I'd probably be very annoyed because there'd be snow everywhere. But if I was with him at the time, it'd be a lot of fun. Um, Things like sitting in my cupboard for three hours in the pitch black and then nearly scaring me to death, though. Yeah, that'd be less fun. I'd rather not have that side of Kevin. Overall, what an amazing person. Let's just leave it at that. Now moving on to our next post about Kevin. Kevin discovers Google Images. At my previous job, working outdoors, the head of our safety department was a Kevin. My workplace had a bit of a reputation for having somewhat of a good old boys mentality, where older men were elevated to higher positions without offering others an opportunity to interview for the open position with the reasoning, they've been here for years and we feel they'd be a good fit for this role. This particular Kevin could often be found sleeping in his office, especially on days when everyone else worked together to shovel snow, which is a safety hazard and something the head of safety should be addressing, but I'm getting off track. He lacked very basic tech skills, but would always harp on about how a lot of young people these days just aren't quite as sharp as us older folk. Yes, that was an actual quote during a company-wide training about how to manage stress. As the safety representative of my own department, I would frequently have to try to communicate with Kevin on safety-related issues. Unfortunately, his voicemail box was always full because he didn't know how to check them, and any attempt to send him an email would be met with, I never got that, because he didn't know how to check those either. This caused me to constantly have to physically print out documents, drive all the way to the other side of the property, and hand deliver them straight into his mailbox. So, his lack of basic knowledge about technology was well known to me at that point. But I did not think it was this bad. One day about a year ago, he left a very long voicemail for my department about this incredible feature he found on the internet. If you go to the Google login page, you'll see a little button that says images. (laughs) 
If you click on that and type our workplace into the box, all kinds of pictures pop up of my department section. I mean, there's pictures of everything here. If you scroll down the list, you can even see pictures of what our workplace was like years ago. I really think this could be a great resource if you are all looking for pictures of our department. There's some really great ones here, so I figured I'd just let you know about it. My co-workers and I just stared at each other, speechless, until one of them said, did, did, did Kevin just discover Google Images? Yes, yes he did. What's great about this story is that Kevin himself earlier in the post says, you know what, I just don't think that the younger generation are as smart, are as switched on, are as sharp as the older people. And that is obviously the reason why they're giving, you know, older people the jobs because they can, they can get away with it. And they say stuff like, oh yeah, they're just not as sharp as, as, sharp as us, the younger kids. But then <laughs> when you realize he doesn't know what Google Images is, that, uh, that whole kind of notion, that whole kind of theory goes out the window. doesn't really make much sense anymore. I don't know any person young or old genuinely i don't know anyone that i know who doesn't know what google or google images is guys do you know anyone literally name any person in the world that doesn't know what google images is madness how can you not know <laughs> but secondly he's like he's so happy about his his finding he's like guys it's an amazing resource you can you can't just find pictures of you know our workplace but you can also find pictures of other amazing stuff like anything in the world it's google images you know crazy scenes what an idiot that's all i can say now moving on to our final story kevin tries to cheat in a test in front of a teacher kevin is the most stupid person i have ever met he is 18 at the time this happened he thought that all animals including lions zebras insects etc were the same type of animal but just are different sizes and are just wearing very fancy clothes he's a flat earther and thinks the earth flies through the universe like a frisbee and all the planets stars moons etc in our universe orbit the earth one time our country's presidential election happened not the 2020 election he would sing and chant vote for president now to random people he'd meet when i told him how disrespectful it was he said but everyone in our country voted for him so why is it disrespectful i just told him that people had different opinions and may not vote for him he said that i was a liar and just continued doing what he was doing now here is the story it was nearly time for a very important assessment it determines if we will graduate or not during the exam all books would be placed outside the classroom and two teachers would be invigilating the class what the teachers didn't know is that kevin had a textbook inside his table despite being focused on the exam i was actually watching kevin do the exam he just stared at the ceiling, played with his stationery, or wiggled his fingers for 30 minutes straight without writing anything on the assessment paper. He didn't even touch it for 30 minutes, and the time was an hour, so he only had half an hour to complete it. One of the invigilators actually got up to go check on him, and he said he'll do it later. Finally, he wrote his name and took out his textbook to copy the answers. The invigilator saw this and got up to take his textbook. He refused and said he apparently had the right to copy the answers. But the teacher simply took his textbook and Kevin just sat there defeated and continued to do that until the time was up. He only did one or two questions out of the 82. After the exam, my friends talked about how hard it was and gossiped about Kevin's fantastic amount of efforts. I don't know what happened next, but Kevin didn't graduate. Well, uh, for some reason, that doesn't really surprise me. I can think of no reason as to why Kevin wouldn't graduate. He seems like the model student. If anything, he was going to do the test in half the allotted time. So that just shows to me that, uh, yeah, he's very bright. Um, no, uh, weird bloke. I'm not really sure what his kind of logic was there. I think the thing is with all these people, they really, uh, they're not like trying to do it to be funny. They're just really stupid. I guess I should have really understood that by now. Um, maybe I am a Kevin, but anyway, yeah, he just he, maybe he just didn't even clock that you're not even allowed to copy and test If he is that dumb, then I'm sorry that you know He is and he's really not gonna have much of a successful life at all But yeah, maybe he just genuinely thought that he was allowed to copy out of a textbook Why he didn't do that at the start of the exam and, and gave himself less time anyway I don't really know but yeah again a very very strange person Kevin thinks it's a good idea to do bicycle tricks in the freeway so one day me my first friend second friend and kevin are playing outside riding our bikes 
While riding, we realize all of us need some air in our tires. So everyone goes home, asks their mum. I asked my dad, no way my mum would let me go. And we all got four yeses. My dad gives us some money for the air and we're about to head off. When? Guys, let's use my phone as a GPS, Kevin says. My first friend, let's call him James, says, I mean, I know the way. But I'm the oldest. We do what I do. So we use the GPS. Come on. Now, Kevin wasn't wrong. Kevin was 12, I was 11, and my other friends were both 10. But I knew I should have stopped him. I say, Kevin, you heard my dad, right? We're going to insert gas station here. So make sure you type that in on Google Maps instead of gas station, okay? Chill out, dude. I got this. But Kevin puts in gas station, unbeknownst to the rest of us, and plays eeny, meeny, miny, mo with the results and just hits start. The four of us get on our bikes and follow his GPS. At this point, I'm thinking to myself, up the street, make a right down the giant hill, past the playground, and across the busiest street in the neighborhood? Wait, hold up. I say aloud, guys, we're going the wrong way. No, we aren't. The gas station's this way. Are you sure? What did you type in? I typed in gas station, duh. I told you not to type in gas station. But dude, look. He shows me his phone upside down. He didn't have auto rotate on. Give me that. I start poking around in Google Maps to find out that Kevin was about to lead us to a gas station approximately three miles away. And by the point we were at, we weren't even in the same city anymore. Dude, stop. You're going the wrong way. You're leading us to the other gas station. It's not even in the same city, let alone the same neighborhood. I'm going home. No, OP. I'm the oldest. We do what I- Oh, get over yourself, Kevin. I interrupt. I say to my other friends, I'm out of here. Feel free to stick with the travel genius over here if you like. I turn my bike around and start walking at home. After about 15 seconds, friend one and two turn around and start following me. And that's when Kevin gets his bright idea. Hey, everyone. Watch me. While we stand in the bike lane, we watch Kevin get on his bike in the middle of the street and he begins doing tricks in the middle of the road, while car after car narrowly avoids him as well as each other. My second friend said, Kevin, get out of there. You're going to get yourself hurt, I add. Yeah, and we ain't paying no medical bills. But it's awesome. Here, you guys want to see me do it again? Oof. Kevin falls off his bike, lands on his butt as his bike skids off into the road. He doesn't get up. We all say, Kevin, come on, there's a car in the way. But Kevin says, but I like it here. At this point, the rest of us are done with his stupidity. We put our bikes on the sidewalk. My first friend and I grab Kevin by his arms and drag him out of the road. And my second friend grabs his bike and apologizes to the person in the car. There was, however, a good ending. We eventually got to the right gas station and I never trusted Kevin with GPS again. Well, I'm not entirely sure if that is a good ending or not. I mean, your friend nearly died, but I guess you got air in the end and and then now Kevin knows that he can't be trusted with directions in general. I mean, you did explicitly say to him, Kevin, don't just type in gas station, type in this specific one on Google Maps or whatever maps you were using. But no, he just put gas station. Like if he was on his own there, would he legitimately have ridden three miles on on his own out of the town just to get some air for his tires i honestly think he might have done that's how stupid this guy is now moving on to our second post distant cousin bleaches hair with clorox and blames me for some background so when i was born my grandparents insisted on inviting every single family member to meet me in their beautiful old house now my grandparents live in a rather small town but live more on the countryside so they have a lot of space to host guests which is good because my family is huge now i'm terrible with family trees but my family has two different names and sides from a marriage a few generations back I won't say them because duh, but my side is quite lovely, with the exception of the boys being hard-headed idiots. Now, the other side, my distant cousin's side, is awful. They're toxic, rude, racist, classist, and Bible thumpers. I don't like talking to them because they see me as half-breed, because my dad is white and my mum is black. Others say they're jealous because I got all my family's good DNA since I am a pretty good looking young lady and I feel I'm as smart as I need to be. Their side is a few fries short of a happy meal. 
When they came to meet me, every single person had to say something nasty about me. From my caramel skin, to my black straight hair, to my big brown eyes. They even said my light bulb nose would grow to be too huge and ugly for my face. The only problems I've ever had with my button nose is it gets really oily in winter. My cousin, the entitled brat, was born around the same time as me and had pale skin, bright blonde curly hair, a little chiseled nose and bright green eyes. As we both got older, my aunt, her mother, hated how everyone would compliment how beautiful I was getting and how big I was. I got my mum's side with my body shape and grew into a curvy girl. My cousin had a beautiful shape, but her mum wanted her to be much bigger up top. But I think her hair is what really made my aunt hate me. My hair curled up like crazy as I grew and is now beautiful and bouncy. I keep it at bob or pixie length. And my cousin's hair is bone straight and turned a dirty blonde like her mother's. So at this moment in time, I'm a 13 year old girl who is living my best life when I go down to see my grandparents for a little event in my family called train day. My side of the family were farmers and have a lot of land to this day and one of them used their land to make a little train area and every one of my family is there. We're two days through the party when half of the entitled brat my cousin's family comes and starts acting all sweet as sugar. Everyone is nice because we're polite to family but I hide inside. A while later, the entitled mum, the entitled brat's mum, comes up to me. Now this is a rough retelling of the conversation. Hi, OP. How are you? How are your parents? Um, they're fine, and I'm fine. That's good. Wow, just look at how you've grown. The entitled mum looks me up and down, but plays with my hair. Thanks. How are you? Oh, I'm good, but my daughter, the entitled brat, is so sad. Now, I'm being too worried about a cousin that doesn't even like me. Oh, no. Why is that? (sighs) Ah. She's being bullied at school for her looks and she then makes a fake sad face. What? But she's pretty. What are they bullying about her? Oh, nothing. They just don't like how dark her hair is. At this point, I'm currently going through a hair phase. Uh, have you tried bleaching it? I suggest. The entitled mum is clearly confused and interested. Bleaching? What's that? Is this thing people with hard hair like mine do when they want to dye their hair pink or white? Do you think she'd like it? The entitled mum smiles unnaturally happy. That sounds perfect. I'll get right on that when we get home. I was happy I could help. Of course, you might want to have a stylist do it the first few times, then ask them how to, but the entitled mum cuts me off. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, She'll be fine. Fast forward a week after we get home and my mum gets a video call from the entitled mum, screeching about how her daughter's hair was ruined and it was all OP's fault. My mum calls me down and I hear the entitled brat crying in the back as she weeps about not wanting to shave her head. What happened? That bleaching thing didn't work and ruined my baby's hair. You did this on purpose, didn't you? I'm about to cry at this point, thinking I've ruined my cousin's life. Oh my god, I'm so, so, so sorry. What went wrong? Did she have something in her hair while you bleached it? No, but now her hair is all dry and gross and it's your fault. I, I, I'm sorry. Maybe the b- brand you use is bad, but what did you use? We use Clorox and blah, blah, blah. At this point, the entitled mum faded into the back as I realized this woman used cleaning bleach on my cousin's hair. Not only did she do it herself, but she didn't look up anything to try and help. My mum then said, you use cleaning bleach on your daughter? The entitled mum started to shrink a bit at the yelling, Yeah, well, I didn't think it was so hard to- But my mum cut her off. You don't use cleaning bleach on hair. Get her to the hospital now. The entitled mum, realizing she did something dumb, hangs up and doesn't call back. From what I heard from my family, the entitled brat was able to not have her head shaved, but had to get almost all of it cut off into a low to scalp pixie. Her hair was now horribly bright bleach blonde, But shockingly, she didn't hate it. The shortcut and the bright blonde made her happy and she still keeps it short, which her mum hates. Okay, I'm not gonna lie. 
I actually wouldn't have known myself that, you know, it's a different bleach for your hair than just the normal cleaning bleach. I mean, it sounds obvious when I say it, but I would have had to think about it. Now, the point is, maybe I can understand. I can just about understand how this entitled mum might have confused the two and might have thought it was the same bleach for everything because I kind of thought that a little bit, you know, not really thinking about it. But what I can't understand is how she just went ahead with it without looking for any help online or in person. I would never ever be as stupid to do that. That is really, really dumb. I mean, yes, you can be unsure about things, but then surely if you are unsure, like this woman must have been, she clearly didn't know the right bleach to use, ask someone who knows or go and get it done by someone professional. I mean, that's what I did in the past. I've actually bleached my hair before. I might get a little picture to insert right now. This is me with bleached hair. It's pretty good. I might actually go back to that at the end of 2020 if you guys do get 600,000 subscribers on my channel. But hey, let's talk about that the better. I didn't do that myself because if I did, it wouldn't look like that. It would look like rubbish and my hair would probably have fallen out if I'd used the wrong sort of bleach. This woman should have done the same, clearly. Just use some common sense. I guess she is clearly a Kavina, but wow, that is um, a step too far. And I'm surprised, you know, that it, it, it didn't damage this person's head, this entitled brat's head more using cleaning bleach on skin surely that's like insanely dangerous no i would never even want to touch bleach with my hands let alone the top of my head one of the most important parts of your body yeah um fortunately she likes it i guess but wow i would not want some bleach on my head cleaning bleach that is hair bleach sure cleaning bleach no thanks i fired kevin after one day of amazing stupidity probably one of the stupidest people i've ever met he was a 26 year old male and turned up an hour and a half late the first day He was brought in by his mum, which I thought was kind of odd for a grown man I let that slide, but then things just got worse It was a small roadside cafe slash eatery So I thought i'd get him started on small duties to ease him into the way of the place I asked him to put new toilet paper in the toilets a minute or so later. I hear him yelling OP it won't fill the toilet roll holder I'm like, what? That's a pretty simple thing. He calls out again, so I tell him to bring it to me so I can show him. He's carrying a roll of paper towel. It's almost three times the length of the TP holder. Kevin, I say, that is paper towel. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Have you ever seen toilet paper that big in your life? Uh, no. Right. Furthermore, and probably more perplexing, can you not see that this massive roll couldn't possibly fit on this small bar? Yeah, yeah, I thought that was odds. Oh boy. Well, the day goes on, and after the kitchen is pretty much closed, except for pre-cooked baked goods, I get him to give a general clean, and ask to make sure he wipes down all the benches. I leave him to it, as I assume he's doing fine. Wrong. One of the other staff comes and says we've run out of toilet paper. And I'm like, what? That's that's not possible. Sure enough, though, all the packs are torn open and empty except for the rolls on the holders. At this stage, I realize there can only be one culprit and call Kevin over. Did you do something with the toilet paper? What the F is with this guy in the toilet paper? Yeah, I used it to wipe down the benches in the kitchen. You used eight rolls of TP to wipe down the benches in the kitchen. Why are you using toilet paper to wipe down benches? I don't like using the dishcloth. Who taught you to wipe down benches with toilet paper? Have you ever seen anyone wipe down benches with toilet paper? The cloth was dirty and I didn't want to clean it out. By this stage, I'm thinking day's nearly over. Just let it go and I'm sure it will work out fine. Yeah, you know what's coming. Kevin strikes again, and this time it's beyond moronic. So I've got him on serving customers, pastries and the like, because all you have to do is take it out of the glass bay, put it on a plate and give it to them. He doesn't even have to ring it up. Just pop on a plate and give. Well, one of the customers orders three scones with jam and cream. He's behind the counter doing his thing and I have a little peek and see, yes, he's cut them in half and managed to put jam and cream on them. About a minute later, the customer brings the scones back up to the counter. There's something really hard in these scones. I put down and it was like crunching on a rock or something. Of course, I'm puzzled. Oh, I'm really sorry about that. When Kevin cuts in, it's probably just the seeds in the jam. Now, there's something about the way he says this that makes my alarm bells ring. Show me what you put on these scones. And I start marching toward the prep bench. 
Sitting on the bench is the bowl of whipped cream and next to it in a plastic bag is a broken glass jar which contains the jam. The mother effer is feeding the customer broken glass. I didn't think it would be a big deal. Are you freaking insane? I grabbed the plate of mostly uneaten glass infused scones. How is anyone supposed to eat this? To my utter, utter amazement, he proceeds to eat them in front of me, all the while crunching on glass and flinching every time he does. I'm paralyzed, dumbfounded. When he finishes eating, he says, Do you think I should go to the hospital? You're fired. And you see, guys, that is precisely why I love this subreddit. Stories like that where Kevins end up eating glass thinking it's the right thing to do to impress their manager who is absolutely fuming at them. I mean, you wouldn't find stories like that anywhere else on the internet, would you? I mean, come on. Just madness throughout the whole story. I don't know what he was thinking in part one and part two, you know, with the toilet roll. But then eating glass to, to ensure his manager that it was okay. It was still tasty. Nah, that, that's a step too far, even for a Kevin, surely. Now moving on to our next post. I think I married a Kevin. I may have married a Kevin. He initially doesn't strike you as a Kevin because he had a very successful career working for a government alphabet agency. However, some of the things he believes. Once this man gets a notion in his head, you cannot remove it with dynamite. If his mother or his teacher, sister Mary Godzilla, told him something 50 plus years ago, then that was revealed truth and could not be changed. Sister MG told him men have one less rib than women. It has to be that way because God took Adam's rib to make Eve. I had to show him side-by-side -side images of male and female skeletons in a medical encyclopedia and make him count the ribs before he believed that sister may have been mistaken. Sister also told him that plate tectonics was only a theory, and since theory means guess, there wasn't any truth to it. You know how South America and Africa look like they would fit together like puzzle pieces? Well, sister told him that was just a coincidence. God made the world the way it was, and the bits didn't go floating around like ducks on a pond. What about Pangaea? Is that all a lie then? Theory equals guess also shot down the theory of evolution, the theory of relativity, and a bunch of other science things that didn't agree with the Bible. However, he seems to have come up with a whole bunch of stuff all on his own. There can't be a volcano under Yellowstone Park because they wouldn't be dumb enough to put a national park on top of a volcano. Vaginas are just inside out penises, so a woman who is using a tampon has to remove it to pee. When you burn a candle, only the wick burns. The wax just runs down the side of the candle holder. He had no explanation as to what happens to the wax in a jar candle. Meat is not the muscle tissue of animals, but something else called the flesh. He did not explain where the muscles go if meat is this mysterious flesh. Meat also only comes from mammals. Beef is meat and pork is meat, but chicken and turkey are not meats, nor is fish. Cows just spontaneously start giving milk when they reach adulthood. Having a calf every year to start the process has nothing to do with it. On the other hand, hens must have sex with roosters before they can lay eggs. That the clear button on the oven stops the timer. It does not, it turns off the oven and that is all it does. I've made him start the timer and then punch the clear button. See, the timer is still going. He still tries to use the clear button to turn it off. We've only had this oven for 20 years. The microwave and the toaster oven are basically the same appliance. And since you can put plastic things in the microwave, you can use them in the toaster oven as well. He only did this twice though, since I really yelled at him the second time. He does seem to have grasped no metal in the microwave though. So I guess this is a plus. Sometimes he has to figure things out for himself. My dad would say, you can tell him and tell him, but some folks have just got to pee on the electric fence for themselves. Take the top rack of the dishwasher, for instance. The section on the right-hand side is about half an inch wider than all of the other sections. That makes this the ideal section for cups because they just fit. I told him this. I had him put a cup in the right-hand section and see that it just fits. I then had him put a cup in another section where it did plainly not fit. About a week later, he came to me and said, I figured out that the right-hand section is wider than the others, so that's where we should put the cups. And this evening's Kevinisms. One, chopped is the same as sliced. He was going to a church picnic and had volunteered to bring sliced tomatoes and lettuce and onions for the hamburgers. He asked me to chop all of these things for him. Not slice, chop. 
I had to explain the difference. Two, that the volume of a medium-sized bowl is exactly the same as that of a smaller bowl. This is a long-standing confusion, actually. I cannot tell you how many times I explained that to save cabinet space, you put small bowls inside medium bowls, which go inside large bowls. You do not try to stack a medium-sized bowl on top of a small bowl. This man, who can pack a moving truck tied to the Marilyn Monroe's girdle, simply cannot grasp this simple concept. Or maybe, instead of a concept, it's just a theory. Ah, oh, to be fair, I quite like this, Kevin. You know, you meet those people that are so good at some things. For example, I imagine that, you know, his work is to do with packing trucks or, or, or is a trucker or whatever. And he's probably amazing at that, as OP has said. But they're just so bad at stuff. You're like, how can, how can you be that good at this? And then not understand this other concept, which is obviously like really similar. It, it, I guess it's just brain just works in a different way to the majority of people. But yeah, this guy, by the way, this Kevin is not a bad person, is he? He's just like a little bit dumb, let's just say, but dumb only in certain aspects of his life. As I, as I say, he's probably a genius and lots of other things that weren't mentioned in this story. And also for OP to marry him, who sounds like a, a nice person, OP, then he's probably a lovely guy as well. So it's not that harmful, is it really? Just a nice guy. A little bit clueless at times though. Kevin and the speeding fine. I just remembered I used to work with a Kevin. My partner and I worked in another town, about a 45 minute drive, and would occasionally give this Kevin lifts. He would pay us petrol money, so we had no problems doing that. The poor dude though was as dumb as a doorknob. Nearly everything went straight over his head. We discovered that he had a helicopter mum, and while he was in school, she would do his homework for him, etc. And as a full grown adult, she would still baby him. She was the one who contacted my partner to ask for us to give him lifts to and from work in the first place. We also had Rob, the conspiracy theorist, who got a lift from us as well. Kevin and Rob would sit in the back seat, and Kevin ate up everything Rob spewed about chemical trails, reptilian overlords, microchips given to everyone at birth, you get it. After a little while, Rob talks Kevin into getting his own vehicle, and him and Rob start driving to work together. All goes well for about a month or so when they approach us asking for lifts again. No problems. On the way home, we asked what changed their minds. Rob goes off about how him and Kevin worked late one afternoon and Kevin drove home. Well, Kevin was speeding, 120 kilometers per hour in a 110 kilometers per hour zone, and went straight past the police officer. The cop obviously pulls out and flashes the lights, so Kevin, in his infinite wisdom, floors it. Rob was screaming at him to pull over and reckons he was driving at about 180 to 200 kilometers an hour to get away from the cop. Guys, that is about 125, 130 miles an hour. They get about 10 minutes out from our town and Kevin finally pulls over. Obvious loss of license, vehicle impounded, and on top of that, a $2,000 fine. I asked Kevin why he didn't just pull over in the first place. He said he was tired and just wanted to get home. I was gobsmacked. Kevin said he couldn't work out why the punishment was so severe, even though he was lucky he wasn't arrested. He really thought it was okay to do that because he was tired? I left that position shortly after that. So thankfully, I didn't have to deal with him or Rob anymore. Wait, okay, so you're legitimately telling me that this Kevin <laughs> went past an officer speeding who then put their lights on and then he said, you know what, screw this officer. I'm going to beat him in a drag race and just went, just zoomed. It was like, you know what, I'm tired. I want to go to, I want to go to bed. I can't be dealing with all this, you know, police drama and maybe getting arrested and losing my license and maybe even going to prison if I hit someone for life. Um, no, I'm tired. I want to go home. Guys, if you didn't know what Kevin's were before you heard this story, I think you now probably do. Now moving on to our next story about Kevin. Kevin tries to cheat on his final project. Here's a short story about a Kevin I went to high school with. This Kevin was a smart kid in a lot of ways, as many Kevins are. He was in all the advanced track, college prep classes, so he definitely had book smart, if nothing else. For the final, in our AP English class, we had to do a whole big project. Part of it was a normal academic essay on a topic. Part of it was choosing several different ways to demonstrate or apply our topic in creative ways. Kevin is into the creative part, but bored by the regular essay part. So he decides to just plagiarize it. You probably know a bit about different types of plagiarism and how teachers can spot it. Sometimes it's just failing to attribute some quotes. Sometimes it's lifting a few paragraphs from Wikipedia and just changing a few words around. And sometimes it's wholesale using someone else's work. 
But Kevin went for none of these strategies. Kevin found an essay online that he thinks will work. He hits control P and he turns it in. No copy and paste, no reformatting. The URL is printed at the bottom of every page. The website menu and ads on the page, they're printed too. The links within the text are even helpfully printed in blue ink. This guy has literally just printed it flat out from the website. And of course, he was absolutely shocked he didn't get away with it. Wow. Yeah, guys, that is something I actually forgot to mention. In a lot of these stories and a lot of these situations, the Kevins are book smart. You know, they have really good academic knowledge or just very good in education. It's when you kind of take them out of that context that often a lot of these stories happen and you have these dumb moments from people who you think are book smart. But in this situation, it's actually in school. He's probably a very clever guy and very creative guy. But um, doing this sort of thing, yes, you're obviously going to fail. Like, what are you thinking, man? Oh, I just fear for him in later life because with that sort of, you know, decision making, what is going to happen to the this Kevin when he has to face the real world. Now moving on to our third post. Kevin from the cult. My friend has a lodger who is a Kevin, a female Kevin. For some reason, I dislike the term Kavina, which is what female Kevins are often referred to, so I'm just gonna call her Kevin. When I met Kevin, I initially tried to be friendly towards her. She mentioned her church, so I asked her which church she went to. I wasn't familiar with it, so she told me a bit more about it. It became apparent though that this was a cult. She tells me that their pastor, almighty cult leader, possibly more important than Jesus, wrote the world's best-selling book. I managed not to sarcastically reply with, he wrote Harry Potter, and just made a mental note never to discuss religion with this person again. In recent times, I've learned that Kevin's cult believes that coronavirus is a conspiracy to turn people away from God. However, Kevin personally believes that the virus was made by evil scientists in Wuhan because a laboratory and a market in the same place? That's just too much of a coincidence. I'm not sure if anyone's told her that our city contains multiple laboratories and markets. It's not just that Kevin is a cult member. She's also just dumb. She had no idea how to change a light bulb. She's nearly 30 years old. She's got no concept of food hygiene. She leaves meat unrefrigerated for ages. She defrosts meat in the sink without even cleaning the sink first. I'm unsure, to be honest, how she's not died from salmonella. Her most recent achievement also involves defrosting meat. Apparently, she only wanted to defrost some of it. And of course, the best way to separate the frozen meat would be to whack it against the windowsill. A piece did detach with some force and flew into the window. My friend has now billed her for a broken window. After reading the first story in today's episode about the Kevin who didn't even realize that he was going so insanely over the speed limit and just wanted to get home because he was tired despite the police chasing him, um, I thought, I genuinely did, that he would surely be the most stupid person we'd meet in the whole of this video. But I was wrong, I think. Because this person just has just done so many things that are just unbelievably brainless. Like, not to the extent, to be fair, of running away from the police, but like just crazy inhumane things that you would never do a normal person like me and you would just never do that sort of thing honestly i don't even know what to say to half of the things that i've just read it's so weird why i mean the meat stuff that's very very strange chucking meat at a windowsill that's very very strange but also thinking that the coronavirus was invented by evil scientists in wuhan <sighs> okay let's move on so then now moving on to our final story Kevin keeps making his eye worse, also doesn't understand UK medicine. So Kevin, a 26 year old, a friend of a friend, has had a recurring eye infection, weepiness, soreness for nigh on two years now and refuses to go to the doctors because every time it even slightly clears up, he insists his cleaning regimen is solving the problem. This is also for another reason I discovered later. It's not as if an employer can force him either as he somehow runs his own business. When asked, he insists his regimen involves an eye bath, a little cup of sterile water held onto the eye for a few seconds, eye lubricant, essentially thick, soothing eye drops, and then regular eye drops, all of which can be bought from the supermarket. It sounded pretty normal, to be fair, when he put it like that. But when I happened to be at his house and witnessed his actual regimen, I was speechless. The sterile water Kevin uses in the eye bath is straight out of the tap. Topped off with a couple of sprays of non-bleach cleaning spray. 
He insists that's okay as there's no bleach and the brand is labeled as eco-friendly. Eye baths are meant to be single use. Kevin told me that he doesn't empty the eye bath for days and uses it multiple times each day, meaning the water is getting dirtier and dirtier. The eye lubricant he uses is five years out of date. I asked him how he's never bought a new bottle and he shows me the box of 100 he found in his parents' attic years ago. The regular eye drops he uses is a mixture of tap water, the same cleaning spray in the eye bath, and then a sprinkle of Himalayan pink salt that he is sure sucks out the impurities, all refilled into an old eye drop bottle. Not only that, but each time he uses the mixture, he squeezes a large amount onto his eye and then proceeds to put his finger directly onto his eyeball and rub in the liquids. To compound this, he works as a gardener and most times I've met him, he has had soil on his fingers. I told him how harmful and dangerous all of this was for his eyes and that he has to go and see a GP, a general practitioner, a doctor in the UK, immediately. But Kevin then berates me, accusing me of trying to patronize and baby him. He also states he doesn't want to pay to visit a GP, leading me to realize he thinks he has to pay for all health services rather than the NHS providing GP care for free. I assume this is because he's a huge fan of house, so thinks all medical practices work that way. He also has the same reaction to our mutual friend when he tries to help and insists his regimen is working, but that he just gets things in it because of his job. Not even his parents have been able to convince him otherwise, even after they bought him weeks worth of actual eye care products. I try to have empathy, but a part of me still waits for the day it gets even worse or something else actually breaks through the Kevinness of his thinking. I mean, genuinely, guys, reading stories like this makes me feel so much better about myself because despite the most stupid things that I might have done in my entire life, I've never, I don't think anyway, done anything as stupid as this. What the heck? And he wonders why his eye isn't getting better because you're making it worse, my friend. If I did that sort of stuff to my eyes for two years, I probably would go blind. That is how stupid what he's doing is. It's unbelievable. And yeah, I genuinely do think that reading stories like the ones that I've shown you in this video makes me and you probably feel, you know what, I may be stupid, I may make some dumb decisions, but I definitely don't go to the extent of people like this. So at least I can feel a little bit happy about my life after reading stories like this one. My God. Kavina apparently doesn't understand the meaning of the word juice. I am a full-time carer for my disabled mother. We have other carers that come in to help with things like showering and also to give me a bit of a break at times. And one of those carers is an absolute Kavina. By the way, guys, if you are new to this subreddit, Kavina's pretty much are female Kevins. There have been multiple instances of her flying her Kavina flag loud and proud. And we have stuck signs with basic instructions up all over the house to try and combat this. But what she did today still has me baffled. So... Part of my mum's disability means she has trouble swallowing. Because of this, all her fluids need to be thickened. We have thickener we can add to any fluids, but also keep some pre-thickened drinks in the fridge for convenience. Right before Kavina was due to leave, my mum asked if she could make her a drink before she left. Kavina has stuffed up making drinks in the past, not thickening them enough, etc. So my mum says, just put two of the already thickened juices into a cup and stir them together. That way you don't have to add anything. So off Kavina goes and returns a minute later, saying, here you go, I mix pineapple and strawberry juice. She leaves and me and my mum look at each other and I say, we don't have any strawberry juice. But she brushes it off, suggesting maybe she meant the mixed berry juice or maybe she used one of the strawberry purees from the cupboard because that's something she would do. So thinking it is harmless, my mum takes a big sip and proceeds to start choking and dry heaving, nearly vomiting all over herself, which is very dangerous for her. She's been in hospital for aspiration pneumonia more than once. After a few minutes of back patting until she can actually breathe again and then cleaning her up, I take the cup and open it to find that it is full of pineapple juice mixed with curdled strawberry milk. Yes, Kavina mixed pineapple juice and strawberry milk, somehow unable to tell the difference between strawberry milk and strawberry juice and not realizing the effect that the very acidic pineapple juice could have on milk even as she was stirring them together. My mum suggested maybe she needs more training as a carer. I suggested maybe she needs more training as a freaking human being. 
Uh, yeah, OP, I'd be more than inclined to agree with you on this one. I, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I don't really know how you, you know, confuse juice and milk anyway. But then when you see the acidic reaction between that juice and the curdled milk, I mean, <laughs> surely when you're stirring it in, you're like, oh, something's not actually right here. I wouldn't be expecting such a frothy mess. But uh, no, she didn't care. Kavin doesn't care. And um, despite being your carer, your mother's carer, and, you know, that tending to mean that she must look after her and really keep a watch out for anything that she is ingesting that may not be, you know, the best thing for her. She just doesn't care, really. And she was like, you know, yeah, have it. I'm sure that'll be all right. Who cares if he can't swallow? Just choke and die. That's what it seems to me anyway. I mean, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, that's just what it seems to me. Now, moving on to our second story. I dated Kevin for two years. Here's a story about our missing car. I met and quickly fell in love with Kevin when I was a freshman in college. We decided that things were getting serious and decided to move in together. All of this was a mistake, but I've learned quite a lot from the experience. I have tons of stories about this, Kevin, but today I shall tell you the tale of how our car got stolen. Kevin has somehow always had strokes of luck, which I think in hindsight is the only reason why he is in existence today, because the boy ain't bright. He lucked out somehow and bought a 1987 Acura Legend with 50,000 miles in it for one and a half thousand dollars in great condition. There is only one problem with this. Kevin is a horrible driver to the point where he ruined that car. One of his friends once told me, OP, if you let Kevin drive that car, it's going to end up being a $1,500 car. He's driven over curbs and destroyed tires. He's driven the wrong way in one-way traffic a few times, including rush hour. He's even smashed out the driver's side window in a fit of rage. Eventually, he would turn that poor car into a horseshoe by running a stop sign and getting it T-boned because he was crying. At the time that I was dating Kevin, we lived within walking distance of our university on a semi-quiet street behind a Walgreens in a tiny house that can only be described as a shack. This tiny house was behind an even more tiny apartment, quadplex, four tiny apartments just big enough to be considered livable. I work for the company martofwool.com as a call center operator within what I would call walking distance, but others would not. If I walked to work, it was a 30 minute walk. Kevin did not work. In fact, he never kept a job longer than it took to get that first paycheck. After Kevin got the car, he'd drive me, he would never let me drive, to work. There was one night where I was cooking and I needed a few last minute things. Kevin volunteered to go to the Walgreens. Usually he'd walk. It never took more than five minutes, but on this night, he decided that he would take the car for this 60 second drive. He comes back after some time and the night proceeds as normal or as normal as a night gets when you're dating Kevin. The next afternoon, I'm getting ready for my shift at the call center. As Kevin would be driving me to work, I took my time getting ready. You know how it is. Well, when we walked out the door, the parking spot where the Acura would be was surprisingly empty. This was after he smashed the window out of the driver's side door, so I assumed that someone finally decided to make off with the dang thing. We looked all over for it. It was nowhere to be seen. We asked our neighbors in their tiny apartments. Nope, nada. I had to call into my job to explain why I was going to be late. You see, I think the car's been stolen, I told my manager. I doubt she believed a word I said. And if you've ever worked for the Mart of Walls, even the dot-com side, you'd know that you're basically living on borrowed time when it comes to calling in for anything. So, Kevin calls the cops and reports the car as missing. While we are waiting for the cops to arrive, and I'm standing in the empty parking space in disbelief, a strange look comes over Kevin's face. Wait, he tells me. I think I know what happened to the car. You wait here. Kevin takes off down the streets in a hurried walk. Five minutes later, a brown Acura legend with a busted out window comes flying down the street with a sheepish looking Kevin in the driver's seat. Kevin had forgotten that he drove the car to Walgreens and left it there and had walked back to our house. Yeah, Kevin, that, uh, that is uh, pretty dumb. I'm not going to lie. I do want a bit more, you know, from this particular Kevin. I want to see more than just one case where he's been dumb. But put yourself in that position, right? You know the car's lost or stolen and, well, stolen. And you're racking your brain trying to think where it could possibly be. I mean, OP said that you both looked all over the streets for it, all around the neighborhood, asked all the neighbors. And still, throughout all that time of thinking about where it could be and looking for it, it didn't once, you know, clock in your brain that, ah, yes, I might have driven to Walgreens the other day or earlier today. Uh, yeah, that, that makes you a little bit stupid. But, you know, we've all been there. We've all done something like that. 
I need to see more from this Kevin to prove to me that he is an actual Kevin and this wasn't just a Kevin-like moment, you know, because we've all had Kevin-like moments. Actually, you know what, guys? Comment down below times where you've been a Kevin or a Kavina. It doesn't necessarily make you a Kevin, and that is why I'm, you know, I'm a little bit cautious about this guy, but um, it definitely gives you a Kevin moment. Let's just say that. So yeah, comment down below and I'll go through and read them. Now moving on to our final story, Kevin makes a sandwich. This Kevin has been in my life since age six. We grew up as friends and I have many stories. This one though is one of my favorites. Kevin got a job at a gas station slash fast food place. During his first week there, they were training him on the sandwich line. He said everything was going well and he had the manager there with him to help him out. He finally gets his first customer. The guy orders a steak and cheese. Keep in mind that a steak and cheese sub is Kevin's favorite food and he makes good ones at home, so it should be no issue for him. Well, Kevin makes the man sandwich and even the manager comments on his good job making it. Right as he was about to wrap the sandwich, the customer notices that he forgot to cut the sandwich and asks Kevin to do it. Kevin says, oh yeah, I forgot, sorry about that. Then proceeded to lay the sub down on its side and cuts the sub long ways. The manager and the customer are now just both staring at Kevin in complete disbelief. Finally, the manager asks him why he cut the sandwich like that, and Kevin responds with, that's how you showed me. That was not how he was shown. So, the manager and customer at this point start to laugh about it. The manager explains that in no way, shape, or form will you train that way. He tells Kevin he can keep that sub for himself and to make the customer another one. Kevin makes another perfect sub and begins to wrap it up when the customer notices for a second time he didn't cut it. Now, to this day, none of us could figure out what went through Kevin's mind. Maybe he thought it would get a good laugh, maybe he was super hungry and thought he would get another free sandwich. All we know is that he laid that second sub down on its side and cuts it long ways again. Both the manager and the customer were upset by this point and the manager sent Kevin away and just made the sub himself. Kevin was removed from the substation permanently and made into a cashier that shift, which there are more stories about. Now, when I finally confront Kevin about the story, other friends were around too, I had to ask him, Kevin, if you had a long day at work and you're starving, so you stop to pick up a steak and cheese on the way home, and right before they hand you what looks to be a delicious sub, they cut it in half like the way you did, would you accept that sub? Kevin emphatically said with a look of disgust on his face, F no, I wouldn't take that sandwich. He didn't understand our hysterical laughter. Ah, now this person, this person is 100% a Kevin because you know what? He, he's done it twice <laughs> and he's been told how not to do it after he's done it so weirdly the first time, yet still the second time is like, you know what, screw it. I'd rather cut a sandwich long ways than normal. I, I, so does this mean, right? Say you got your sub like this, yeah? And normally you would cut, if you got like a, a foot long, for example, from Subway, you would cut it down the middle so you'd have half and half to just eat normally. Does, this, does that genuinely mean that he cut it like this? Uh, like <laughs> along it how is that how is that even possible to eat at that point I, surely it's already cut that way anyway because it sliced through the more i think about it the more confusing the more confused i'm getting guys can you please um educate me in the comments down below how is this possible surely if he was cutting it long ways there'd al already be a cut down the middle because that's where the bread gets cut to put the filling in no am i getting this wrong I i've just i've just clocked I think I'm right, no? You, you, you do say cutting it the long way. Is this all a lie? Is this story all a lie? Is this world a lie? Am I purely a figment of your imagination? He wants to DNA test her kids. So, I can't even completely wrap my brain around this, Kevin. But when my friend, Sage, told me this story, I just had to get her permission to post it here. She gave it, so here we go. Fair warning, I fear the number of IQ points that may be lost in reading this. Sage started dating Kevin about two years before this incident. Things seemed to be going all right between them. She told me he was a bit of a derp and sometimes incredibly oblivious to some things. He couldn't pick up subtle cues and even suggestions flew over his head with about a mile of airspace between his skull and the suggestion. She originally chalked it up to him being on the autism spectrum as she had a few other friends who have similar problems picking up cues. So she just switched her behavior from talking to neurotypical to talking to neurodivergent and the bump smoothed out for a while. All is well and good. Then the talk of taking the relationship seriously came up. 
marriage, becoming a family. And that's when the plane hit the mountain with a cartoonish bang. Kevin announced that he wanted to DNA test Sage's kids to make sure they were his. Kids who were five and three when Sage and Kevin started dating. Sage said that she had to come to a full stop in the conversation for several seconds while her brain rebooted. They're not your kids. You know they're not. My ex-husband and I had them together before I ever met you. She had still been pregnant with the youngest when she and her ex had finalized the divorce. That's a whole other story. Yeah, and now that we're getting married, they'll become mine. I just want to DNA test them to be sure of it, replied Kevin. Let me see if I understand this. Do you, do you actually think my children's DNA will change to become biologically yours when you adopt them? Obviously, I just want the confirmation on paper is all. Insert, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works meme here. There was a long conversation about how DNA didn't work that way with his rebuttal that adopting them would make them become his. Then there had to be a conversation that becoming his children would only happen on paper and in the legal system. That no, the children would not magically transform into his own biological children once the paperwork was filled out. Him insisting that everybody said the kids became theirs once adoption happened. Her explaining the concept of adopted children are loved just as much as if they were biological, and that was what that meant. Him insisting that everything pointed to kids becoming theirs. His mum eventually had to become involved to back Sage up. His dad had to become involved to back Sage up. A few books had to get involved to back Sage up. Kevin was furious. He couldn't understand why people would ever adopt a kid if the kid didn't become the actual biological child of the people who took them in. How stupid and selfish it was for kids to retain the DNA of the sperm or egg donor. How could any kid who wanted to be adopted refuse to change one little thing so they could have parents? DNA doesn't work that way is a BS excuse. He ranted, he raved, and right in front of his own parents, he told her that if her kids weren't going to become his kids, then the marriage wasn't going to happen. He told her that he would give them all a week to change their minds and agree to be his biological kids. He said, when they stopped being selfish and when the DNA test proved it, he would take the kids in. Sage said to me, and that's how the relationship ended. Uh, wait, hang on, I replied. Was he just looking for an excuse to break it off? Did he just get cold feet or want to date around some more or... Nope, he really is just that stupid. His mum called me on the sly and very gently suggested that I just break it off with Kevin because no matter how much she and his dad talked to him, he's adamant about it. He's even saying that he will never date a woman with kids from here on out unless they agree to change their DNA to become his if the relationship becomes serious. So, Sage is single again, having dodged a tactical nuke. God help everyone if he ever breathes. Oh my goodness, what a return to r slash stories about Kevin. Just absolute stupidity unbelievable to be honest when i read the title i thought it was going to be pretty stupid something like a kevin asking a mum to get a dna test for her children or, or something as idiotic as that but i think this was actually worse this was more dumb than what i expected him asking children to change their dna to match his so that they can become a biological family what i mean this is the top comment on the post uh it just says what the frick and I think that pretty much just, just sums up my reaction. Wow. Let's move on to our next story. Kevin and the Coke. I'm going to tell you guys a stupid story, and I'm going to tell it just the way I remember it. Yes, it's about Kevin, but I'm not going to spare myself here either. I used to be an idiot too. I don't have much of a defense, except that I'm from Florida and this took place there. Maybe that's all the defense I need. I don't know. This story happened during and because of my employment at a Radio Shack. If you didn't already know, Radio Shack workers used to be absolute freaking party animals back in the day. I tell you this because no one out there seems to understand just how hard a nerd can go and because it's germane to the story. So yeah, I was working at a Radio Shack in South Florida and we just completed our inventory. Anyone who has worked in retail knows just how awful and tedious and freakishly time-consuming an inventory can be. Since this happened back in the 1990s, before QR codes and phases came about, we had to find, count, and record each resistor, transformer, and capacitor 
every freaking item in the whole store by hand with nothing but pen and paper. And boy, did Radio Shack have a lot of little parts. It was mind-numbingly dull, and the process took several days to complete. This was also back when the movie Titanic came out, and the company had some kind of eldritch corporate partnership, which required us to play that abominable song on repeat all dang day. You know the one, don't make me say it. Naturally, out of self-preservation and sheer desperation, many of us employees resorted to unholy amounts of drugs and alcohol. Okay, I need to pause the story for a second so I can ask you guys a question. Have you ever had someone sidle up to you? Like, actually crab walk sideways and then kind of slide the last two steps up to you? Well, if you haven't, let me tell you that it's just as weird and off-putting as you're imagining. I bring this up only because that's the thing I think about whenever someone mentions Kevin. For story purposes, you guys should know something about Kevin. I don't have enough characters in this subreddit to do his existence justice, so I will just give you a basic synopsis. This guy was something else. I'll qualify that statement by saying that he once got stranded for four years in Brazil after a falling out with his prison pen pal girlfriend. And before you ask why a Brazilian would write to an American inmate, I'd explain that he wasn't the ex-con, she was. He found her through the back pages of some magazine. The story of how Kevin learned about long distance telephone charges goes here, but I'll save that tale for another time. When this girl finally kicked him out of her house, something to do with identity theft, smuggling, and exotic parrots, Kevin attempted to force the American government to send his broke ass back to the United States by literally lying on the street outside the embassy and waiting like a banshee on bath salts. As you can see, Kevin wasn't the sharpest of tacks. Sorry for that interruption, but I needed to make sure you guys understood a little something about Kevin before I continued telling this tale. So back to the story. It was around 10 p.m. and we just finished reconciling the inventory counts for the last time. Done. Finally. While it did turn out to be an excellent inventory, it was particularly long and grueling and we were all exhausted and hangry by the end of it. My boss, being awesome, decided to celebrate by picking up a bunch of beer and pizzas and inviting us all back to his house. This is technically where the actual story starts because this is when Kevin sidled up to me in the parking lot and asked me if I wanted to go with him real quick to pick up a bag of Coke. I guess I'm not the sharpest of tacks either because I agreed to go. I had a car, but Kevin insisted on driving. This was a problem because Kevin drove a busted 1976 Lincoln Continental. It was probably a beautiful example of American automotive engineering in its day with its original deep dark green paint job and flippy headlights. But now it was decrepit. The seats were sticky where they weren't threadbare and the exterior was a veritable museum of failed cosmetic repairs. The thing was covered in primer, missing all but one of its hubcaps, and the glove box oozed some vile amalgamation of spilled coffee and shea butter. Because you see, Kevin had a skin condition. The car smelled just awful, like a dead squirrel filled with old Arby's and whipped cream and then left to rot in the tropical sun. If I'm being honest here, I rather appreciated the shea butter and coffee. In that car, the ooze was a feature. Standing there in the pale, washed out light of the Radio Shack sign, I weighed my options and made my decision. I laid an old hoodie strategically over the passenger seat and climbed in. After all, free drugs was always worth a bit of hardship. Right? Wrong. After a surprisingly uneventful drive, we got to his friend's place. He went inside and when he came out, he was bouncing and armed with a huge eight ball. His guy really did him right. The very sight of this thing made me super excited to get back to my boss's house so we could get down to some serious hoovering. Kevin put the car in gear and began to talk. I was ignoring this as irrelevant, absorbed in my own thoughts. When all of a sudden, Kevin hit a trash can. Because I wasn't sure if the hit was intentional, I glanced over. Uh-oh. Kevin was bent over, sweating and bug-eyed, fidgeting with the radio and simultaneously glancing back and forth between the rear view mirror and the side mirrors. Worried, I sat in watchful silence as he navigated his way out of the neighborhood. His conversation never faltered, even when we dinged a mailbox. Dang. With a sinking feeling, I realized that his gills were way past geeked. It was now around 11.30 and traffic had begun thinning out. His driving had deteriorated exponentially since leaving his friend's place and I was only just then coming to terms with the fact that the reward, fat though it was, might not be worth the imminent disaster I could now see barreling down upon me. 
I knew then that this night was going to end badly. Something was going to happen. Something bad. My mind raced. Snap. We've got drugs. Kevin is driving. Kevin is driving this car. Frick. Frick, frick, frick. The vehicle is obviously held together by a combination of prayer, spray foam, and bondo. Also, he's got no registration and an expired license. I know all of this because Kevin told me after we left with the coke. Kevin told me a lot of things during that drive. He answered a lot of questions about himself that I never asked. In fact, Kevin was so deep in coke conversation that he missed a critical turn on the main highway. Upon realizing that he missed this turn, he waited for the next intersection and against my desperate protestations, immediately cut across three lanes of traffic and slung that huge boat of a car around in a U-turn. While rather graceful, the move was illegal and there was an unmarked police car behind us. Oh, I freaked out. Then when the cop lit up his lights, I freaked out again, this time out loud. You freaking moron, I yelled. Kevin pulled over, except Kevin didn't pull over to his right like normal people do. No, he pulled over to his left into a turn lane. The cop pulled up behind us and waited, probably confused. I think it was this confusion that saved me. I say me instead of we, because at this moment, Kevin decided that he had it all under control. If I remember the sequence of events correctly, and I will never forget what I witnessed in those few moments, Kevin winked at me and then proceeded to pull the Coke bag out of his pocket and empty it into his mouth. Uh, what? Then he started chewing. I should tell you that this was a solid 3.7-ish grams of yellow flake Coke. Hard as a rock and uncut, it was huge. I sat awed and mesmerized at the scene unfolding before me. The red and blue lights flashing into the interior of the car made the whole thing even more surreal. All I could think was, oh my God, he's eating it. He's eating it. He's eating a whole eight ball of blow. Wait, wait, he's the driver. Instantly frightened and struggling to overpower the creeping sense of horror shivering up my spine, I screamed at him. Something along the lines of, what the frick? What are you doing, you freaking idiot? And that is the exact moment when Kevin realized that he had royally effed up. Generally, when one gets pulled over by the police, they expect a coherent response, even in South Florida. He flung the car door open and dashed into the night. I can only imagine the consternation of the police officer behind us as Kevin abandoned his car and bounded away into a neighborhood. I sat frozen in the passenger seat, amazed and stunned as the cop car behind me disengaged and took off down the side street after him. To this day, I do not know if there was only one officer in that police car or if he or she was operating under some regulation that made a driver more important than a passenger. It may have been that I was a small chick in a huge car and was therefore camouflaged against the seat. I just don't know. All I do know is that Kevin was gone, the cop was gone, and I was sitting in a running vehicle in the middle of the road. Yeah, I took off. In what I can only describe as a semi-fugue state, I drove Kevin's car back to the radio shack. After dropping off his car and getting mine, I drove to my boss's place, determined to get my fair share of pizza and beer in recompense for this fiasco of a night, and also to inform my boss that he would have to open the store tomorrow because Kevin was most likely not going to make it in on time. I was regaling everyone with the story of just why he wouldn't make it when the front door banged open and Kevin stumbled in. I'm not exaggerating when I say it was like one of those old West saloon scenes. You know the ones where the whole place quiets when the hero enters? Just like that. Instead, except of a hero gliding, it was Kevin flopping. He was soaking wet and disheveled. Wild-eyed, he was completely out of breath and his shirt was missing. His exposed torso and arms were crisscrossed with deep scratches and abrasions. He looked like he'd been in a fight for his life. We all must have been staring at him in silent astonishment. I know that I was. Kevin squished into the room and collapsed wetly into a chair. In a garbled voice, he asked me if I had his car keys, and then, relieved with my answer, he motioned for a beer. Turns out that he did manage to successfully evade the cops that night. At the last moment, he found a drainage canal and jumped in. Fortunately, this saved him from arrest, but unfortunately, he wasn't alone in that canal. According to Kevin, an alligator chased him through a bunch of thorny brush out of the water and then up into a yard. 
He said he was terrified almost to death, but couldn't scream for help because his mouth was frozen from the coke. He barely escaped with his life. <laughs> what? Now, when it comes to this last part of the story, I don't know how much is actually true. However, I do know that I saw that man literally chow down on close to four grams of rocked up pure Peruvian marching powder before freaking swallowing it. Then I saw that same dude evade the police by vanishing into the dark like some kind of overweight Hungarian Zorro before reappearing triumphant and unscathed hours later. Based on this, I choose to believe him about the alligator. Either way, it was a night to remember. And that, my friends, is the stupid story of Kevin and the Coke. I'm sorry you read this. I'm absolutely gobsmacked by that story. That was unbelievable. Uh, wow. I mean, I say unbelievable. In the literal sense of the word, it was very believable. I agree with you, OP. I feel like all the stuff that you definitely saw happen in front of your own eyes leads me to believe that the alligator story probably is legit as well. Like, once you've done all that other stuff that we know for sure happened, saying that an alligator chased you in a canal is not even that mental. It's not even far-fetched. It's probably the most normal part of this entire story. Oh my word, I mean, what have I just read? That was incredible. Kevin the inept felon runs from police and loses something more than his freedom. And not for the first time. This occurred in 1997. I was a news photographer, video not still, for over 20 years. The majority of that was at a TV station in a large-sized city. I'd been at this place less than a year, so I was working weekends. On a Sunday morning, I was heading to work and I noticed it had rained earlier because of all the puddles of water around. This city was a ghost town on Sundays, so I expected it to be somewhat slow until a reporter came in later to come up with a story. I walked into the newsroom, which at that time was only occupied by the guy running the assignment desk, RK. I was about to take off my jacket and get some more videotapes for my camera when RK told me not to get too comfortable. He had to send me out right away. What's going on? I asked. I'm not sure. Police Watch Command called us and said they had a story. You're kidding, I said. For context, whoever is working the assignment desk in the morning has a daily ritual of calling up all the local police and fire departments to see if anything has happened overnight. If it was a slow night, they'd just say no and we'd move down the list to the next one. If something did happen, they would let us know then. They never call to say they had a story for us. RK told me that a police sergeant was waiting for me at an intersection about four blocks away. I grabbed some tapes and drove over there, not knowing what to expect. The area I went to was an older part of town that had a few railroad tracks crisscrossing where freight trains would normally pass through. The sergeant sees me pull up and he gets out of his car, walking up to me with a smirk on his face. I walk up to him with all my camera gear and I ask him what is going on. He says, let's just start the interview and I'll tell you. Weird. Usually I try to get an idea of what's going on before I start an interview, but whatever. I go through the motions of clipping a microphone on his tie, getting him into position so the lighting looks good, ask him on camera for his name, spelling, and rank. Okay, I asked, what's going on? And the sergeant proceeds to tell me the tale of Kevin, the inept felon. Earlier that morning, Kevin had been driving around looking for somebody to rob to support whatever bad habit he had at the time. It was an older part of town, but it still had nice homes in it, so not a bad neighborhood at all. After a while, he finally spotted three men walking down the sidewalk. He parked his car and ran up to them. He had a metal tool in the pocket of his jacket. I think it was part of an old steering wheel club that he was pointing at them through the pocket to make it look like he was armed, and he told them he wanted their cash. Judging by his appearance, they thought he was homeless, and they started digging around for any loose change. The first guy didn't have anything. The second had a 10 spot. Kevin realized he wasn't making himself clear, so he motioned with his gun at them to let them know he meant business. The third guy finally clued in on what was going on, so he pulled out his very real gun and pointed it at Kevin. As I was being told this story, I imagined Kevin's eyes bugging out of his head a la Looney Tunes at this point. Realizing he's outgunned, Kevin pulls out his gun and takes a couple of swings at the men before sprinting back to his car. The three men manage to get a plate number before he drives off. They call the police with the plate and a description of Kevin. The car comes back as stolen and the police pull out a B-O-L-O -O for Kevin and the car. For those of you like me that are not from America, that stands for be on the lookout. A patrol officer in the area heard it and thought it sounded like Kevin since he was a frequent flyer in the back of cop cars. He decided to head down to a popular park downtown 
that was frequented by criminals, druggies, and other riffraff. Upon approaching the park, he sees, parked along the curb, the vehicle in question. And there is the Kevin he knows standing next to it, talking to some of his ne'er do well friends. Kevin notices the cop approaching and makes a beeline for his ill gotten car. They start a short chase around downtown. Fortunately, since it was Sunday morning, downtown was deserted. They eventually end up at the place where I'm conducting the interview. Unfortunately for Kevin, there is a slow moving train going through the intersection and blocking his escape. Kevin, in his infinite wisdom, decides that the train is moving slow enough that he could easily jump in between the cars and get away. Believing he has enough of a lead on the cop, he abandons his vehicle and runs for the train. At the beginning of this story, I said I'd noticed it had rained earlier in the morning. Apparently, Kevin didn't notice. As the pursuing officer was stopping his vehicle, Kevin was jumping in between two train cars, but he slipped on a wet coupling, flopped onto the street under the train, and got his left leg cut off above the knee. The cop stopped in his tracks, quickly spun around and reached into his patrol car to grab a fistful of the oversized zip ties police were using at the time as flex cuffs. He ran over to Kevin and made a tourniquet with them around what was left of his thigh. He called it in and an ambulance and fire truck showed up to stabilize Kevin and haul him off to the hospital. After the sergeant I'm interviewing finished his tale, I'm just standing there in a dead stare with my mouth open. After he confirmed he wasn't joking about the story, I asked him a couple of follow-up questions and unclipped the mic. I let him know I didn't need him anymore if he needs to go and I asked him where exactly it happened. He points to the tracks ahead of us about 30 feet. I asked him if it was still bloody up there and he said no, the fire department hosed everything away. I thanked him for his time and got to work getting some B-roll. After shooting for a minute and wondering exactly where it happened, I noticed a bit of leg meat wedged in between the street and the train track that the fire department had missed. I got what I needed there and headed to the park where the officer spotted him and into the neighborhood where he tried to hold up those three guys to get some additional video. I make it back to the station where RK asks me how it went. I sit down and tell him the tale of Kevin the inept felon. His reaction is the same as mine. We both laughed about it for a minute and he tells me about the next story I need to shoot. The rest of the day is rather slow. So slow that I'm told that the story about Kevin is the lead for the 5 p.m. news. Back then, after we shot a story, we just handed it off to an editor and that was the last I heard about it until news time. I eventually go back to the train tracks to meet up with the reporter for the live shots. We talk briefly about the shot he wants for the background and chuckle about Kevin's misfortune. Five o'clock hits and the anchor in the newsroom throws it to the reporter. He gives a brief intro about Kevin's adventure and throws it to the package, the pre-recorded story with the reporter's voice track on top of interviews and video. I listened to it in my earpiece, waiting to cue the reporter when they throw it back to him on camera. Now, since someone else edited the story, I missed out on one last bit of information. The reporter explains on camera that this was not the first time Kevin's own actions resulted in an injury. Two years earlier, Kevin and another man got into a physical argument involving a shotgun. They were trying to wrestle it from one another until the muzzle gets pointed downwards and blammo, Kevin blows his right foot off. As the reporter says this over the air, I start saying, what? Halfway through, I instinctively slap my hand over my mouth. I never did go back to look at the air check, but I'm sure that made it on the air. He throws it back to the newsroom and the director clears us. My reporter starts taking off his mic and earpiece and notices that I'm just staring at him with my mouth open once again. What? He asks. Let me get this straight, I say. So not only is this guy through his own fault missing his leg, but now he just doesn't have any feet? Yep, he says. Some people's kids. Oh my goodness me. I mean, look, maybe we could have forgiven Kevin for this one incident. I mean, people make mistakes, right? And I'm all for seeing the good in people. Uh, You know, it's not the best idea to try and rob people and then make a stupid decision by trying to jump through two trains. Uh, But but nonetheless, you know, we all make mistakes. However, the fact that he's already blown off one of his feet and now is literally footless just confirms, if we didn't know already, which realistically after hearing the first first part of the story we did, that this Kevin is indeed a Kevin and is an absolute clown. I think what, what is very important here to remember is that he was trying to do this right as in you know escape the the cop with one foot because he'd already blown off the first foot right so was he running with one foot i mean does he have a a, a prosthetic 
I feel like there's more information here that we need. Would he have made the jump if he'd had two feet? Who knows? Maybe if he had the foot in the first place, he would now have both feet still. I don't know. I mean, this is just as typical of Kevin's story as you can get, really. Just crazy, insane. And ultimately, the guy is just left disabled for no real reason apart from his own stupidity. <laughs> there we go. Now for our next story about Kevin. Courier Kevin will die on the code hill. A few days back, I used one of those courier apps. I type in my info and delivery address, and I wait for the guy or gal to come pick up my package. They're usually friendly and efficient. No issues until now. This time though, Kevin shows up. First sign of trouble, he calls my phone. That's never happened before. Hi, I'm Kevin from X Delivery. I'm at your door. He most certainly isn't, since that would have required me to buzz him in to access my floor. But nevertheless, I humor him. Hi, Kevin. Did you follow someone in? I look through my peephole, and as expected, there's nobody in sight. No, I'm here. Open, please. I hear an aggravated lady through the phone. Tell them it's the wrong door. Kevin? I say. Yes? Where are you? I'm at your door. No, Kevin, I'm at my door. And you are not. Have you checked the address? Kevin hangs up, then proceeds to call again. Mom, open please. I'm at your door. At this point, the woman at the other end is threatening to call the police. Kevin, please leave that poor woman alone. Walk out and find the right building. I then tell him the address. I don't need to check the building. I used the entry code. The door opened, so it's the right building. Kevin, I'm now in my building's hallway and you're not. So clearly you're in the wrong building. I'm telling you you're wrong. The woman you've been bothering is telling you you're wrong. And I'm not having this conversation all day. Especially considering I'm freezing my butt off, coatless, in my slippers, gradually losing my compassionate adult veneer. Kevin hangs up again and then calls back. Kevin? Yes? I swear to God, if you hang up on me one more time, this won't end well. Now I want you to listen to me very carefully. Are you listening? Yes. Good. Tell me. Are you on XYZ Street? Yes. Lovely. Please walk out of that building and stand on the sidewalk. I'll find you. I look out and I spot Kevin two buildings up the road. He was easy enough to find. The company dress code is bright red. Cue extra negotiations to get him to walk to me. Remember, I'm still in slippers, no coat on. Kevin finally reaches me and the first thing out of his mouth is, why does that building have the same entry code as yours? How would I know, Kevin? I don't live there. But but two buildings can't have the same entry code. That makes no sense. You know what makes no sense? You insisting that I should know what goes on over there. In a building I do not live in. He stares at me for a few seconds, then mumbles, Sorry I wasted your time. I did ask him if he was sure he could handle this delivery. He declared he was fine now. And that is the most bizarre Kevin encounter I've had to date. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anything screams Kevin more than... Oh my goodness me, how does another building have the same entry code as yours? Does he genuinely think that every building in the entire world with some form of security system or, or entry system should be in communication and say, none of us are allowed to have the same code as any other building ever in the entire world? I ideally, that would happen, I would say. It'd be, it'd be great for security. However, it does seem quite impractical. It really does. I do actually feel kind of bad for this guy. I don't think this was malicious, given that at the end he says sorry i wasted your time i kind of feel bad and i do think that, that a lot of the time with kevin's they are not malicious people unlike entitled parents and, and, and a lot of other people that we see on you know revenge subreddits for example that are kind of bad people kevin's are just doing what they can i think but they're just pretty dumb and have no common sense kind of like this guy and now for our final story about kevin just a quick one to finish Kevin misses total solar eclipse in a car wash. Back in 2017, a lot of the USA got to see a total solar eclipse. At every location, totality only lasted for a couple of minutes, so it was a huge deal. There hadn't been a mainland US total eclipse for decades. The Kevin in this story is my dad, who took me and my brother, I was 13 then, my brother was eight, to see the eclipse with a big crowd in the middle of Nebraska. Everyone was standing around waiting, but my dad insisted the eclipse was an hour later because of daylight savings time not working on an eclipse. Why would they want to save daylight when the moon is in front of it? This in spite of the 200 people gathered in the middle of this grungy small city slash large town, Grand Island and E to watch. So my dad, Kevin, says he's going to buy potato chips at a gas station nearby. I figure this is okay. Worst case, if he doesn't get back in time, he will watch from his car. 
An hour later, totality is over and everyone gets ready to leave. Papa Kevin comes back and it's the first time I've ever seen him cry. He explains, he got a car wash and missed it. There's another eclipse next year and Kevin says that this time he's taking a bike. Oh my gosh, if there's one thing that you don't want to do when you know there's going to be some form of eclipse, it's kind of shelter yourself from the outside world, the sky in any way. You know, go inside, go in a car wash where there are things all over you and you're inside the car and, ah, oh, so dumb. I mean, look, if there was better reasoning behind it, perhaps I could let this Kevin off. But the fact that he said that daylight savings time doesn't work on an eclipse, as in what, you have to forget the fact that, that time has changed or the hour has changed because there's an eclipse. Like eclipses and, and other planets don't have different time in general. It's just, I, I, I can't even begin to kind of understand or work out what he's trying to say here. Surely if you see a group of 200 people waiting for something at a certain time, you don't think, oh, they're all wrong and I'm right. Let's go and wash the car. Seems pretty uh, stupid. And again, you know, he's not a bad person. He's really upset with himself at the end, you can tell. But maybe in the future he'll learn this lesson. Who knows? I feel bad. Once again, I do kind of feel bad. And I feel like that's sort of the, sort of the case with a lot of these Kevins. Kevin thinks he can speak every language in the world. I used to work with a guy named Kevin who was convinced that he could speak every language in the world. He was always bragging about how he could converse with anyone in their native tongue, no matter where they were from. One day, we were at a work event and a group of foreign colleagues came to visit. Kevin immediately jumped up and started speaking to them in what he claimed was their language, but the look of confusion on their faces told a different story. It turned out that Kevin had just been speaking gibberish, mixing random words and sounds together in a bizarre attempt at speaking in their language. He had no idea what he was saying, but he was convinced that he was impressing them. To make matters worse, Kevin started insisting that the foreigners were the ones who didn't understand their own language properly. He even tried to correct them on their pronunciation and grammar. Needless to say, the rest of us were cringing and trying to distance ourselves from Kevin's embarrassing behavior. It was hard to believe that someone could be so clueless and yet so confident at the same time. From then on, Kevin's delusions of linguistic grandeur became a running joke among our team. But we also learned to be more careful about taking him at his word when it came to anything else. Okay, there you go. That is our first Kevin of today. Now you might be thinking, uh, yeah, absolute idiot. And you'd be right. Maybe you're thinking to yourself as well, how could anyone be more stupid than, than this Kevin right here? And it's a, fair, it's a fair comment, it's a fair question, I'll give you that. But just hold your horses, because the Kevin that we're about to see now is like 10 times as dumb. It's genuinely incredible. Here we go. Now for our next story about Kevin. This one is sensational. Strap in. My co-worker Kevin. Drywall, defamation, and d picks. Quick note, the Kevin in this story is actually named Kevin. Make of that what you will. I, an 18 year old man, worked my summer job this year at a hardware store in the Midwest, USA. It's a smaller franchise hardware store, not a giant one like Lowe's or Home Depot, so the owner has a bit more freedom to do what they want. In this case, Kevin is the owner's son, and the owner, probably illegally, hired Kevin for $18 an hour, significantly more than we make. And, as I'll show you below, he definitely did not deserve such a wage. There were three main tasks that summer job teenagers like myself and Kevin had. Cashier duty, sales, and stocking shelves. Kevin did okay, barring a few minor incidents, with stocking shelves, but the other two were chaos every time he got near them. On my first day, I was working with Kevin and a friend of mine from school. We'll call him Jake. Then there were two full-time employees staffing the store an old guy, let's call him Walter, and an even older woman, the store manager, who'll be named Edith. These are the best old people's names I've got. Kevin had cashier duty, Jake had sales, I had shelf stocking, and Walter was the second cashier. A Kevin welcome. Me and Jake both got started on our respective tasks for our first day and did everything pretty much by the book until around 11am. We'd been open for a couple of hours when Kevin sauntered in but nobody had really noticed him missing since Jake and I didn't know he existed yet and Walter barely had anyone to serve as cashier anyway, so Kevin wasn't really needed. But soon, he strolled up to me and Jake while we were in an aisle and said, So, we've got some fresh meats in the most ridiculous movie bully voice ever. We laughed at him and he walked off to his cashier station huffing and puffing. Then he turned around and yelled back, 
Show me some respect, rookies. About five seconds later, Kevin walks into a shelf and shrieks in pain. He goes up to the cashier station and about 10 minutes later, he gets a customer. Now, I didn't see the initial incident, but I sure heard it. Someone was buying some lawn decorations, one of which was a giant glass ball in the shape of a frog. I'm sure you see where this is going. Kevin dropped it and it smashed, then refused to refund the customer, a little old lady. By now, Walter had got on the intercom and called me up front to open the other lane while they cleaned up. I ran up front and see the trash show unfolding. Rather than help Walter, who was on his hands and knees picking up tiny glass shards, he decides to argue with the 90-year-old, yelling at her for buying stupid frog art that looks like an adult toy. I tried to keep Walter's lane moving because three people were in line, but everybody was watching Kevin berate an old lady at the top of his high, squeaky voice. Walter finally managed to wrest the cashier station keyboard from Kevin and refunds the old woman and apologizes to her for Kevin's actions. About an hour later, I get the chance to ask Walter what the heck is wrong with Kevin. Oh, he's the owner's son. He's worked here for three days. It was at this moment that I realized it would be a long summer. Mexico will pay for the drywall. Kevin was a conservative. He made sure everyone knew this, starting every second conversation with a political comment. So on my second day, I was cashiering, Kevin was in sales, and Jake was stocking shelves. Kevin started the day by walking in and yelling at the top of his voice that taxes are too high and nobody needs social security because society is already secure. We have cops. No idea why he thought to do this. Kevin decided it would be a good idea to ask a customer who was buying blue paint for their walls at home why they're putting Democrat colors in their house. The customer walked out. Edith witnessed this and reprimanded Kevin, but obviously nobody wants to say anything to the owner's son. Not 20 minutes have passed with Kevin unsupervised when I walk by to find him switching out every can of blue paint with a red one. At this point, my thought process is that I don't get paid enough to deal with this and it's not my problem, so I keep walking. Well, Kevin felt slighted by me laughing at him the day before, so he quickly walks out of the aisle, gets on the intercom, and yells for Edith. About 10 minutes later, Edith walks up to me and informs me that Kevin blamed the paint thing on me. Edith looked at the cameras and saw it was clearly Kevin, but she let me know to try and steer clear of him because he liked to make other people feel bad. What a loser. Hail damage? Hail Satan. A few days of blatant stupidity followed the incidents above, but nothing quite as crazy. Kevin put wasp spray in the paint section since he said it was used to paint walls. He also brought a tube of toothpaste from home and jammed it into the cash drawer during a shift change, leaving the drawer open and unattended for over an hour. But things really ramped up again after about a week. There was a forecast for severe storms later in the week. So an older couple, both wearing Metallica shirts, came in to buy some plastic sheeting and stakes to cover their garden. Kevin was doing sales that day. The poop hit the fan. The husband explained that he had tomatoes and wanted to keep them safe from the storm. So Kevin, being who he is, explained to them that if you didn't listen to devil music, God would keep you safe. Try praying once in a while. Well, the customer just didn't find this amusing. The couple walked out and left the cart with $300 in other merchandise. Can't cancel Kevin. About a week on from that last incident, Kevin got in trouble. I wasn't there this day for doing a... <laughs> wow. I mean, I can't read this out, but poopler sahoot, I guess is the best way I can describe that, which is a Hitler salute while grabbing his butt. <laughs> what the... That is, that is absolutely ridiculous. He claimed it was anti-Nazi, but his dad, the owner, came into the store and let us all know that he talked to him about it. That is the most ridiculous thing so far. That is mental. Well, Kevin came back the next day, and at this point, me and Jake had just learned to ignore him. But he approached us during a break, and he asked, without any prior conversation, Are you all? Insert gay slurs. We stand slack-jawed in amazement that he would ask that. And Jake quickly responds, no, that's kind of not okay, man. Kevin goes absolutely ballistic. He begins explaining in detail how any man who spends time with another man is gay and how being gay makes God cry. Kevin claimed, you screwed last night and that's why it's raining outside now because God is crying. I really had no words, but Jake did, who told him to go F his cousin in a log cabin. 
referring to Kevin's love of country music and camo t-shirts. Jake got a call from the boss that night, telling him he'd be fired if he ever spoke that way to his son again. Jake tried explaining what Kevin had said, but to no avail. The boss just said his son had good Christian values. That is revolting. Kevin doesn't understand goats. Kevin developed a weird obsession with goats around the middle of the year. It turns out he saw a post online that jokingly said Russian troops were having sex with goats. So pretty soon, Kevin started printing online art of goat-human hybrids, mostly furry art, and posting them up in the livestock feed section with the caption, warning, no goat sucking, because these ideas logically connect if you're a Kevin. Plus, to me, a goat sucker means a desert cryptid. Not a practitioner of bestiality, but I guess that's just me. But the goat thing didn't stop there. Oh, no way. He later tried to explain to me that humans are really descended from goats. His logic for this was that goats are called goats because they decided to go when other animals weren't evolving. Again, I feel insane just writing that out. I do not blame you, OP. That is insane. Duct tape Kevin. Vent problem? During the summer, we had an issue where one of the air conditioning vents for the building wasn't working, which made that corner of the store really hot. He came up with the unusually coherent plan to close all the other vents and try to force air to that vent so we could see if any air was coming through at all. If there was some tiny amount of air, that would mean it was just blocked, not broken. Well, I tell him this is an okay idea and I have him go and do it. But this was Kevin. Would anything be done the simple way? Heck no. Rather than pull the little lever on the side of each vent, he duct taped all eight other vents shut with three whole rolls of tape which he of course took from the shelves without replacing or logging in inventory. We spent the next hour peeling that tape from the vents, which was especially hard given that he crazy glued the tape to the vents. Still, the vent problem was still there. We didn't include Kevin in the next brainstorm and Walter came up with a plan to just shove a garden stake from the outdoor department into the vent and try to dislodge whatever was up there manually. Whatever was up there turned out to be three soccer balls. We didn't have a camera in the vents, since this is a hardware store, not Freddy Fazbear's. Nonetheless, I have a sneaking suspicion as to who put three soccer balls in the vents, and it ain't Lionel Messi. If I'm being honest, this was way above all of our pay grades, and maybe the real Kevin in this part was his dad. None of us were HVAC specialists. Still, I'm sure he couldn't afford it considering all the free passes he kept giving his son. Karen versus Kevin. Kevin was bad enough with the normal customers that when we finally got our ultimate Karen, Walter and I just stood around watching the show. This woman walks in five minutes after the store opens and buys a gigantic bird bath. This thing is like four feet tall and 150 pounds. She needs help to lift it, but Kevin sneers at her and makes me help her even though he's on sales for the day. Well, she comes through my lane and I ring it up for $220, which is the right price as shown on the tag. Karen, though, insists that it's $30. I ask why, and she walks over with me and points to the shelf where a $30 clearance tag is hanging for the bag of bird feeder seed above. I explain to her that it's not $30 for the bird bath, but she points to it and says, but the tag is right there. I turn and whisper to Walter, and we decide to release the Kevin Kraken. I go back to the line, apologize to the other customers, and wave her to go see Kevin, who's standing at the customer service desk. About 15 minutes later, I notice the two are still arguing. At this point, the woman is screaming at him and he's giving it back to her. Except he's not talking about the product, he's trying to explain to her that birds don't need to bathe, they have a built-in shower, that's why they're always scratching themselves. Give him hell, Kevin. Karen decides to take her phone out and start recording. And when Kevin keeps telling her she is a stupid boomer for wanting to give birds what God already gave them, Karen demands to see the manager. Edith walks up and tells Karen to leave. And Karen then finishes the recording by saying that Kevin was defaming her by calling her a stupid boomer and the store would soon be hearing from her lawyers. We actually did. The woman sent a legal threat in the mail. Jake got fired for not helping his co-workers to de-escalate the situation while he was on shelf stocking duty, even though nobody called him to the front. In the boss's opinion, Jake was willfully ignoring Kevin's unspecified intellectual disability. None of us had ever been told that Kevin had an intellectual disability, though we'd be the Kevins if we didn't know, considering all that he did. 
the next day would be my last at the store. Hardware hard on. The day after the Karen incident, we ran out of metal poles. This is one of our more popular items, and we usually just get them in huge bulk and load 10 or so out onto the shelf at once, so that if they fall to the floor, it isn't too much to deal with. I told Kevin to print out an out of stock message, assuming the guy could just go scrape something off Google Images and put it out there. We of course don't have our own out of stock labels since Kevin burned them when he set the microwave on fire in the break room, but that's a story for another time. Kevin did not use Google Images. Rather, he printed an interesting image. Towards the end of the shift that afternoon, I was walking by the metal section when I saw a strange image on a piece of paper hanging off the empty shelf, though I couldn't tell what it was. I walked up closer and could not believe what I was looking at. On the left of the page was a map of Poland. On the right was a nude photograph of Kevin with a hard on taken it, what? Taken in the employee bathroom. Below the two images was a caption, metal poles not found. <laughs> Try these other poles. Oh my god. <laughs> that is <laughs> that is probably the craziest thing I've ever read. <laughs> wow. I'm just going to present this one without comment. Anyway, I quit at the end of the day because Kevin blew up in a rage at me for throwing away the picture, yelling at me that I just threw it away because I hate Polish people. <laughs> Nothing about, you know, the D pick. Oh my God. Now the title makes sense. Kevin has called me a total of 67 times. I counted since I quit from 13 phone numbers. How's he have 13? <laughs> Oh my god, what a story. What a story. And there we have it. Uh, that goes down as the dumbest thing that I've ever put into my brain in my entire life. Metal poles not found. Try these other poles. I kind of want to put that on a t-shirt. That is just sensational. That is like so many things in here. I had to just stop for a second as you, as you would have heard. I just think what is actually happening here? What is going on? This is the first video back from being ill. And it's this. <laughs> Sensational stuff is all I can say. And I, by the way, the thing that screams out is that I need, I need more about this Kevin. Like, the fact that you're, you've given all this content, yet you're leaving out other stories. You know, the microwave story, for example, where he, he set on fire the actual out of order signs. I mean, we've got, to, we've got to hear that. We simply have to. I'm honestly gobsmacked. Guys, get in the comments down below. One word to sum up this Kevin, if you can. If you can't, 10,000. I still don't think we'd be able to. Unbelievable. What? a post.